Hi everybody, welcome to the fourth edition of the summer school, well in this case a school of high performance and disruptive computing in remote sensing. Uh, we are here for this welcoming session. Uh, this building is called Thetius, this is the University of Santiago de Compostela as you know, and uh, this is a research center and we are here with the director of the center. He's full professor and he has been awarded with many, many mm, awards. He can explain uh, the basics of the center and welcoming you. Uh, Thetius has been very encouraging with us, uh, with this uh, school, because uh, has contributed economically and with the work of many persons of the staff who are around here. So, I want to say thank you to Seneng and uh, thank you. Thank you, you, Dora. And, well, my name is Seneng Barro. I'm the director, as Dora said, of this uh, research center. And I welcome you to, to the city and to this center in particular. Well, I, I suppose that you are going to explain with some detail the center, so I'm going to avoid most of the things about the city, but. Uh, uh, just very, very few things. We are called in, in Galicia, in, in our region, a singular research center. This means that we have a specific uh, and a special, in some sense, uh, organizational, um, uh, functional uh, model, or, or yes, model of governance and, and, and organization. It's uh, singular, not for you, for example, or, or probably, but it's quite singular or not so common in Spain, because in Spain, uh, centers like this don't have, most of the times, an external advisory board, for example. We have an external advisory board made of uh, people, top-level researchers in areas related, close related with our research areas, and uh, they decide most of the important things of the cities, for example. They um, decide who is the, the director, by the way, uh, and many other things. For example, they evaluate us periodically, and, and the results of this evaluation has consequences. So this is normal in a research center in, in, in many countries all over the world, but it's not so common, as I, I said, in Galicia or even in Spain. And this is the model of uh, some, a very few research centers in our university since 2008, 2009, so for a period of, of 15 years now. Um, more things about the the center, which are, well, we are very proud because we have recently obtained a, a grade A, which is the excellent in in, the, in Galicia. Uh, we are uh, evaluated periodically by by an external board. Um, it's, it's part of, of the evaluation of the of the regional government, and we have uh, obtained the, the the A degree, which means more money, and this is is really important for us. And, uh, well, uh, I just want to say very few things, and, and I would like to say anyway that we are very proud of Dora, wow. because she is a, a very good researcher, and she is very active, and, and uh, she's always collaborating with, with all the initiatives of the center, and this is one of them, and this is very important for us, because we know, we are confident that this is a a really uh, uh, very important event. Um, it is not a summer school, because we are in spring, <laughs> but the weather is like in, in summer, so you will enjoy the, the, the city, uh, of course. And just, uh, alas, yes, two more things. One is that um, our research line are um, related with artificial intelligence, smart chip design, and high performance computing. And high performance computing, as you know, as well as I know, is very, very important for all research lines and applications uh, in artificial intelligence. In fact, several of our areas, particularly uh, large language, language models, or in general, linguistic technologies, uh, computer vision, or virtual reality, uh, needs 
the support of high performance computing or supercomputing. In fact, we um, collaborate a lot with the FESGA. FESGA is the uh, Galician Supercomputing Center, which is 200 meters away, and the director is uh, I'm here, Lois Rosas. He is going to explain you, of course, the, the center. This is the second um, more powerful supercomputing center in Spain, public supercomputing center, after the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and our collaboration with, with them is increasing day a day. And the other thing that I would like to, to say, and I finish, I promise, uh, is that uh, we will organize the ECAI. ECAI is the European Conference on Artificial Intelligence in October here in Santiago de Compostela. So uh, it's the most important event in uh, scientific event in, in AI in Europe and one of the most important in, in the world. And uh, you are very welcome to come back here in autumn Autumn is also a fantastic uh, moment to, to, to visit again Santiago de Compostela, so you are very welcome uh, to come back and to, to attend ECAI. And, well, that's all. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to be here with you. Unfortunately, I have a lot of things to do this morning, every morning, and, uh, <laughs> and every afternoon. Anyway, thanks for, <laughs> so, for having time for me here. I know that you are very busy, and yeah. thank you. Thank you for this Thank welcoming you. Uh, words. And you are invited for lunch or coffee break or joining I would like, but if, if uh, you have, if you have a few I'm minutes. going to travel to Madrid. Uh. Yeah. During the lunch time. So, uh, thank you very much, Dora, for bringing here this so important event. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're continuing now with the presentation of the school. I don't know what's the best the best place to be. Probably here. And well, this is the, the fourth uh, session, the fourth uh, time that we organize the, this school. Thanks to all of you. We are delighted to have you all here. It's, uh, I, uh, we think that it's a very relevant event in the field of, of remote sensing. It's very relevant because it's a, a way of uh, creating interconnection networks between us. And it's very... Uh, relevant for us and for all these uh, organizations that are here who have supported us with funds uh, and uh, sending people uh, for making presentations here. Um, first of all, I'm going to present uh, our research, uh, research center following with the presentation uh, be, uh, that has presented Senen. Uh, we are here at CITIUS. CITIUS is a singular center of research at the University of Santiago de Compostela. I, in particular, I am a full professor here at the University of Santiago de Compostela, a senior researcher here. We are uh, 35 senior researchers and many others, uh, associate researchers, uh, PhD students, any kind of students, postdoc students, pre-doc students, different levels. <coughs> Some of them are temporal or there are part of, or of the staff here. We have uh, some financial support from European projects, national projects and regional. In the case of uh, European projects we have here some of them related to the design of uh, electronic devices and artificial intelligence mainly. Uh, we have here some photos of Santiago, you know Santiago, we, I'm sure that uh, you all have uh, checked in internet some details about Santiago. The University of Santiago de Compostela is 528 years old, it's very old, uh, an European university, an example of European university, is very old. And the first school was the grammatics school. But now we have uh, different uh, centers and degrees in different uh, subjects uh, from technological subjects to uh, literature and other different subjects. Uh, in, in summary, we have around 24 or 25,000 students. I have checked the number yesterday. And we have two different campuses here in Sa at Santiago and in the city of Lugo, who is not very far from here. Most of the centers are here in the city. We have, in particular in CITIUS, uh, financial support always coming 
from uh, different spin-offs and companies we have been started from uh, uh, research from the, from the center. And we are in this research uh, structure of the university with special funds and special uh, uh, rules to be uh, organized uh, within the university. We have opportunities for postdocs, for predocs, so if someone is interested in coming here to work with us in our projects in artificial intelligence and high performance computing applied to remote sensing, talk to me or to uh, one of our researchers here, I'll present, I will present them at the end. The scientific areas work activities are these. We have devices and computer resources, for example, the, developing, the development of electronic devices. We have high performance computing tools, the development of high performance computing tools. And we have some intelligent technologies, language technologies, robotics, virtual reality, computer vision, and of course, remote sensing. This is bigger because I'm very interested in, in it. But as you know, remote sensing is an interdisciplinary research area. So we are collaborating with other researchers and using tools from computer vision, from artificial intelligence, from language technologies. We are involved in many other areas. This center is called a Centering Intelligent uh, Systems. So we include also support to, ma to uh, machine intelligence. We have the development here of machine learning algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, deep learning. Uh, we will talk about this in detail during the school. And we have also some uh, persons working on social and economical uh, framework for development of artificial intelligence in the future. That is very relevant at this moment to us, you already know. Senen is involved in many committees, uh, together with other researchers of the, of the center, in many national and international committees, uh, developing these uh, um, rules for, for the future of artificial intelligence. <clears throat> Related to our group, our group, I'm coordinating a research group together with another uh, professor uh, called Francisco Arguello. And we have here a research group with different researchers. Most of them are here. We have four uh, persons who are collaborating <coughs> in the organization Alvaro, Pablo, Alberto, and Javier, who are here. And you can co contact them with uh, any issue you have. And you have also. Uh, PhD students uh, from our group here and our research group is basically uh, mm, devoted to knowledge uh, extraction from multi-source uh, earth observation information um, and we basically try to solve problems of the real world uh, based on earth observation information uh, we use uh, multispectral and hyperspectral images and images coming from other sources uh, for example, inventories made on the ground for different problems related to land use or the study of forests or flora or uh, wildfires or different, different issues. So we study the process of analyzing a problem and capturing information and using information coming from databases, from satellites. We accessing the information, pre-processing them, making registry, for example, performing, uh, storing the information in a, uh, in a in an efficient way and we solve the problems of classification, change detection, anomaly detection, different uh, processes that are necessary, for example, for monitoring the situation of our uh, watersheds in Galicia is one of our projects uh, that is active at this moment. And obviously we develop artificial intelligence tools that are necessary at this moment in this field. Uh, we have here one example of, of uh, uh, balancing uh, um, uh, GAN that we have developed in, our, in one of our uh, papers. Well, in general, uh, remote sensing has many applications. Uh, you all are, have work or are related to different uh, applications related to remote sensing, planetary exploration, earth observation, meteorological, biomedical applications, smart cities, uh, damage assessment, different applications. We have working in some of them. We will see some examples during uh, the whole week. Uh, climate change is one of the applications that will be uh, studied in detail. Uh, in one of the sessions. 
and we can observe the Earth, observ Earth observation is the collection, analysis and presentation of data, of data to better understand our planet and we can work with uh, information coming from different sources and we can observe uh, the Earth from different perspectives we can observe, uh, observe the Earth surface uh, using drones, for example, in a very local problem associated, for example, uh, to bangers in a particular region. So this could be uh, considered a local problem, uh, a problem that uh, uh, is uh, devoted to a small group of, of users with an, a very small amount of data to be considered. We also can consider as a problem at regional level or a bigger, uh, a bigger level, uh, at a bigger level of detail. For example, this problem analyzing uh, the rivers in Galicia. Uh, we have uh, the objective to collaborate with the regional government uh, for, for trying to promote new rules for the conservation of, of, the, of the rivers. And we have a more general approach the approach developed by ESA or by NASA, uh, which is an approach considering the Earth as a whole and trying to develop solutions for the whole Earth, uh, trying to be more active in, uh, in participating with, with governments and institutions at a global level. And these uh, problems all, always require uh, large amounts of data to be considered. This traditional approach of local, regional and global observation levels has been modified during the last years because at this moment every problem requires high amount of data because we need pre-trained models in many of the cases. For example, the foundational models that will be explained by some of the persons who are present here during the, during the school are pre-trained models with large amounts of data, not always level, it's a semi-supervised uh, training process, and these models then can be adapted to particular problems. So it's necessary to have big models, and we all know examples of big models that need years to be uh, trained. Well, uh, the Earth observation information um, may include multi-source information and multi-sensor information. Multi-source, multi-sensor, multi-spectral, hyperspectral, LiDAR information, uh, information coming from different sensors, but also multi-source because we are, we are considering, uh, for example, in our case, information uh, from the inventories from people who work in the organization called uh, Aguas de Galicia, water in Galicia, which, which are analyzing uh, the watersheds of our rivers. Uh, but we could, we could include um, bird watchers' notes, for example, uh, tracking biodiversity, uh, photographs uh, taken on the ground, different information, not also, uh, not only, uh, sorry, remote sensing information. We have here an example of one of our studies considering. Uh, information from the ground, uh, reference information around uh, the watershed of a river that is in this part of the slide, and the trajectory of different flights uh, carried out by, by drones. This is uh, the result of a, of a collaboration with an international company called BACO. With all this information coming from multi this multi-sensor and multi-source information, we have a, a big data problem uh, or even a problem beyond big data because we have high dimensional data with high complexity and high uncertainty because we have a lack of information in some parts of the images because these are problems that we have with sensors. If we imagine, for example, an image from a drone, we have uh, some shades, some problems with, the capt with capturing these images, so we have uh, uncertainty in the data in some cases. So we have a huge problem that requires huge computing capabilities. In this sense, uh, the solution have arrived to us with machine learning and deep learning problems, specifically after 2010, uh, the deep learning models have exploded 
and we have uh, seen many solutions for many problems uh, for deep learning. And deep learning is supercomputing because if we want to execute a deep learning uh, training problem, it's necessary to have uh, an heterogeneous computing platform with GPUs, with TPUs, with in-memory computing chips, heterogeneous computing platforms devoted to training these algorithms. And uh, these two terms, uh, supercomputing or high-performance computing and deep learning, are very close related. A few years ago, Lois knows the situation, uh, Tesla, for example, was um, buying some machines, supercomputing machines, basically paid by the local government. Uh, the governments were paying for supercomputings, supercomputers, but at this moment we have many funds coming from companies and for real applications because supercomputing is not only for scientific uh, computing, it's for everyone for solving all the problems. It's for quantum computing, it's for remote sensing, and it's for many real world applications. So it's necessary. Uh, most breakthroughs require heavy computing power, for example, GPT and all these models that we know require, for example, an A100 um, GPU requires uh, 90 years of computing uh, time uh, for training in GPT. So uh, GPT 3.0 is not the, the last one. It's an approximation uh, to know the really heavy computer power required by these by this, uh, algorithms. And obviously quantum computing is a promising approach in this, in this area, a new approach with many uh, projects ongoing. Lois will explain also some of the projects that are, um, that are uh, developed here. And in this, uh, in this uh, framework, we will have also uh, one day of the school devoted to quantum computing presented by Arthur and George that, that are here also. Well, we have different computing paradigms, uh, supercomputing, uh, blockchain, although the, the image is, uh, is not, uh, is, is failing, quantum computing, cloud computing, edge computing, different uh, kinds of high performance uh, and disruptive computing uh, paradigms, and all of them have been used during many years, but not specifically for remote sensing, and we are here trying to promote the interdisciplinarity between researchers of remote sensing and high performance computing and trying to show that some of the tools for using these computing paradigms are easy to use, and we all can use it. This is our objective here. The High Performance and Disruptive Computing and Remote Sensing Working Group has been uh, created with this objective, connect and support the community of, of uh, researchers working in remote sensing and high performance computing. This has been our objective. This group has been created well, uh, we are here, the, the leads of the group, uh, uh, Rocco Sedona is not here, he's from the University of Islands, Iskia Gurun is here and will be teaching during the, the summer school, he has worked very hard for, for the session on Tuesday and Wednesday, and the professor student, yeah, who is not here, is from the University of Kathmandu, is also part of the group. This a group was created in uh, 2021. The promoters of the group have been uh, uh, Gabriel Cavallaro and, and I. Uh, Gabriel is also here. He is also at this moment the lead of one of the technical committees and of the GRSS uh, IEEE uh, organization. He will explain later some details. And uh, through this group, we are organizing different, uh, different activities, special sessions at, the, at IGARS, the International IEEE International Geoscience and Remote Sensing Symposium. Uh, we are organizing tutorials, webinars, papers in journals, and uh, the most important activity for us is this uh, school. This school has been uh, celebrated last year and the, and, the, and the year before in Iceland, in Reykjavik. It was uh, wonderful to to organize them the school and now we are here trying to, to explore other sites and uh, we are planning new activities. Gabriele will, will explain more in detail all these issues. Thanks to all these persons, to, 
to collaborate in the organization of, of the summer school. And if you want to, uh, to join our working group, you have to go to the webpage and join the technical committee, the Earth Science Informatics Committee. Uh, the lead, uh, uh, Gabriel Cavallaro, will explain later in the, uh, more details. But if you go to, the, to this webpage and join uh, SEU, you, you can be part of the working group and collaborating all these activities. If you want, if you have any initiative or an idea that you want to develop, please uh, contact with us. <coughs> this is the fourth edition of the school. We have a couple of photographs here of the school. We, we will take one photographer uh, later uh, <laughs> before, before lunch with all of us. Uh, with the objective of uh, networking and provide some tools uh, related to artificial intelligence and health performance computing and quantum computing. All the material developed here and the videos will be available through this web page. We will have all this information uh, available uh, through the Slack channel and you, uh, you will see videos. We can see videos of the last edition but also the theoretical part of the presentations, not the hands-on sessions but only the, the theoretical uh, presentations will be uh, in this uh, YouTube channel. And well, going to the reality and the particular things of the, of the school, we begin today with this welcoming session, then uh, Lois will present uh, CESGA, uh, the high performance, uh, the, the Galician Supercomputing Center, and uh, he will explain the computing capabilities of the, of the center and the pro ongoing projects. I have to say thank you to, to him also because uh, part of the financial support of this school is provided by, by him. We will uh, visit uh, the, the Galician Supercomputing Center and see the, the, all the machines and the installations that, there. Uh, so we will have the opportunity to know in detail uh, these uh, machines and they uh, support us in all the projects uh, and it's very important for us. At this moment we are training our networks there using the computing capabilities of, of FESGAP. Then uh, Gabriele Cavallaro will present the activities of the working group and uh, he will provide a general view of the organization and, and the technical committee because we have different working groups, three working groups at this moment, not only this one. And then we will have a coffee break outside. Uh, the, uh, this presentation will be uh, made online uh, by virtual source. Uh, talking about one particular project from ESA related to quantum computing and the, the remaining sessions are on uh, Google Earth Engine for Earth Observation and Alvaro and Emma who are here will be presenting the tool and explaining the details how we can use the information and the, the databases and the algorithms provided by Google Earth Engine. And uh, we, ha we will have a social dinner, uh, all the information is in our Slack channel, but if you are interested in um, coming to, to the dinner and you haven't uh, uh, said it before, talk to Alvaro, Al Javier, Alberto, or Pablo to, or to me, uh, and we can arrange uh, the, this, uh, this uh, um, social dinner to, to be all of them, all of us there. The place is called Desa 6, is, um, Desa 6 is 16, is the name of the, of the restaurant, and we will meet uh, there uh, to, to begin with, with real networking. And on Wednesday, uh, we have the first day of the session devoted to large scale artificial intelligence for geo science with supercomputing, supercomputing, and cloud computing. Uh, these sessions uh, will be divided in, uh, in different parts that are presented here. We have also uh, the same structure. Uh, we will finish at 5, uh, and it will be enough because we will begin at half past 9. And um, this session uh, is basically uh, devoted to foundation models, models that are pre-trained with large data sets and that can be tuned for other problems. We will see uh, presentations and uh, hands-on sessions 
uh, with hugging face data sets and with the data sets of, of your problems if you have data sets uh, to, be, um, to be used here for, for these foundation models. Uh, the person, the speakers are here, coming from uh, NASA, NASA, coming from IBM, coming from the University of Huntsville, Alabama, and coming from IBM. Thomas Bruce Wheeler, Wheeler cam, uh, comes from uh, the research division of IBM. They will be um, uh, tomorrow um, presenting all these issues. At we will have at the end of the day a guided tour uh, of the old town. If you have an issue with this, Pablo is the person uh, to talk to. Um, we will meet, uh, he will say the meeting point in the, in the center of the city and we have uh, an hour with, uh, with a tour and it will be nice because the weather is nice so I, I hope that you enjoy. Uh, on Thursday, we have this structure. It's the second day of the session of large-scale artificial intelligence solutions, uh, and it's devoted to large language models and the application of these models to remote sensing. We will have also a presenta presentations and then hands-on sessions, uh, and we'll be uh, in a different building. Today we are here the whole day, but uh, the last three days will be in a different building which is more adapted for teaching, it uh, has more separation, uh, a bigger separation between rows and it's also very comfortable and it's, it's very close to here. And uh, for these sessions, the speakers will be the persons who, who are uh, here. Basically, Iska and Kumar that are working very hard uh, will be participating again and we have a person from IBM Research. At, at the end of the day, we will have, um, well, this is, this, is, this, is, uh, this is incorrect. We have here the visit to, to Tesga on, on Wednesday. I think that it, we have an error here, but I don't know if it's Thursday. Well, so this is here. <laughs> well, yes, yes, it's here. This is, uh, this is not correct. The visit to Tesga is, is, uh, is on, on Thursday. Thank you, <laughs> because I also forget the details. And we will, uh, we will meet there, and we will be split in two groups to know all the details of the, of the center. If we have uh, to join the visit, and we haven't uh, said it before, talk to us, and we try to, to arrange it. And finally, on Friday, he is bad. It's in the, in the day before <laughs> the tour is here, but it's on, on Thursday. Uh, the uh, Friday sessions will uh, finish at 5, uh, and all the whole day is devoted to quantum computing. Two researchers from Poland, from Jagiellonian University, Arthur and Gregor, are uh, visiting us for explaining um, the research they are developing and for uh, explain also the possibilities for machine learning and deep learning using quantum algorithms and how we, we, you can use these algorithms, these quantum computing algorithms. Quantum computing seems a very distant, a very difficult uh, issue to, uh, to work uh, to work on, but uh, they can explain and the uh, fundamentals and they can make it easy for us to approach uh, to quantum computing for developing algorithms and using developable algorithms because quantum computing, as Lois will explain, is the future. So we have to, to be on board and uh, to understand all these, uh, all these algorithms. So we are seeing, we are analyzing all the, uh, the trends that are at this moment relevant and uh, finally, we only have to, to give an acknowledgement to, to all the staff of, of the center who was collaborating with us. We will see some persons um, and to the researchers of the group, uh, these, uh, these persons who are um, with the badges and with all these things, uh, helping uh, with, uh, with the arrangements and uh, who are researchers, active, active researchers in remote sensing here. And obviously to GRSS and NC who has uh, made possible 
the grants that are paying part or co-paying part of the visits of, of some of, uh, of, of you. Uh, to Titius and the University of Santiago de Compostela, University of Iceland, NASA, who has encouraged and has invested time and money in this school, uh, in, all, in, uh, in the, all the editions of the school, IBM Research, the ULIC Supercomputing Center, who is all represented here with persons who will uh, be speakers during the conference, and Gabriele, who is part of also of the ULIC Supercomputing Center and uh, the different uh, organizations we are, we, who are uh, collaborating, uh, Google develop, uh, Developers Special Group 2, uh, Alvaro and Animar are representing them. So I finish here. If you have uh, any comment during the, the school, uh, please tell us, talk to us. We are for for we are devoted to this to the school this day, so please uh, talk to us. Uh, and uh, uh, we are going uh, to present now um, the presentation from Lois Orosa. Lois Orosa is the head, is the director of the Galicia Supercomputing Center since March 2022. Uh, uh, the center has uh, 15 persons working at this moment. And um, as part of the responsibilities, as you might think, Galois Sorosa is leading the Galician supercomputing, the Galician quantum technology hub, uh, the hub strategy uh, uh, forces an investment of uh, millions of euros. Uh, he will explain the details. And before joining CESGA, um, um, Lois was a researcher at ETH Zurich for four for, for, for years, at the University of Campinas, at IBM, at uh, Record Systems, and different places, Universidad de Nova de Lisboa, Univers at the University of uh, Illinois uh, in Urbana Champaign, at Urbana Champaign, how he has been a an active, a very active researcher before being director of FESGA. And thank you for, for supporting us. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Laura, and for the opportunity to introduce FESGA to this uh, uh, nice community. Um, is this working? Yeah. yeah. OK. So OK, we are FESGA. We are the Galicia Supercomputing Center. We are very close to here, maybe 200 meters or something like that. But we don't belong to the university. We belong to the regional government and to the Spanish National Research Council. Uh, this has some uh, uh, unique advantages. Like, for example, we have very close collaboration with the university, with this university, with, but also with other universities in Vigo and Coruña and with the National uh, Research Council. Uh, our mission is to contribute to the advance of science and technology via research and application of high-performance computing and communications. Um, and in 2023, we offer uh, supercomputing and uh, high-capacity uh, communication services to more than 1,000 researchers in, in Galicia and Spain, generally, and also in, in Europe and, and the world through collaboration with our institutions. So, yeah, we participate, participate in many projects uh, since our foundation in 1993. We participate in more than 200 projects, and most of them are European. Uh, right now, we are 50 people. Uh, this is uh, it's not updated, the, the picture. Um, and we are very diverse. Uh, we have physicists, computer scientists, telecommunication engineers, mathematicians, and, and the list go on and go on. And most of the, of the departments do research or, uh, uh, or support researchers from uh, other institutions, uh, mainly universities. So we belong to the Spanish Supercomputing Network. Uh, so we are here. Uh, uh, right now, I think there are uh, 14 nodes, 13, 14 nodes. I think this picture is outdated. Um, and and uh, this Spanish Supercomputing Network, or uh, in Spanish, is, is, is a unique science and technology infrastructure. Um, these supercomputers are uh, unique infrastructures like uh, our others, uh, like, for example, big telescopes in Spain and so on. So we receive special funding for these infrastructures. Um, 
in this uh, in Spain we are the second largest supercomputing node um, just after uh, BSC Barcelona Supercomputing Center and we provide services uh, HPC services to national and international research communities our cu culture is uh, is collaboration mainly as I said we don't belong to any university so this allows us to uh, to collaborate with all the universities basically um, um, mainly uh, the Galician ones and other ones if they collaborate with us or with uh, Galician universities as is the case with CTUs, uh, right? So our main goal is to advance science and research that eventually might have a positive impact on society. And we also have our own research groups and projects. And as I said, we collaborate with other, other research groups as is the case of CTUs. We have many collaborations in natural language processing, quantum computing and others, right? Um, and yeah, basically it's that. So who can use CESGA? So Galician universities, Spanish National Research Council, other research, other research institutions from Galicia, collaborators, our collaborators, but also collaborators with the universities, um, and users from Spanish supercomputing networks. So other researchers from from uh, Spain can apply for the calls that are for projects uh, that require big uh, computing capacities, right? Um, actually, 20% of our, of our um, capabilities are reserved for the, uh, for the Spanish supercomputing network, so uh, and for these calls that come from this network, for this project. So we have uh, infrastructure, and we, I will start with uh, classical infrastructures. Uh, we have non-classical infrastructures that I will show you later, that Dora already talked about. Um, and we have, we have them since 1993. At that time, we have the most, this is in Galician language. Uh, um, at, at that time, we have the, the, most, uh, the, the most powerful supercomputer in, in Spain. It's not, uh, uh, that was in position one, 148 in the top 500 ranking. And along the years, we have many supercomputers also in different uh, positions of the rankings um, until we reach uh, today's supercomputer uh, that is called Finisterrae 3. Finisterrae 3 is a uh, uh, a uh, large supercomputer super with more than 20,000 cores, 157, uh, right now I think there are, a uh, there are more than that, accelerators, uh, GPU accelerators, uh, A100, uh, more than 100 terabytes of aggregated uh, memory, uh, more than 300 terabytes of storage so in SS SSD disk, infinite and network, um, we have also uh, quantum computer simulators and emulators, and uh, it has a big performance of, of four petaflops. Uh, storage systems, we are, nowadays we are, uh, we are having a large demand of, uh, of data, of capacity. Uh, researchers are demanding us a, lo a lot of capacity, so every, almost every year we are, we are uh, increasing the, our capacity right now we are in uh, aggregated storage is uh, more than 33 petabytes we have also other uh, hardware resources not only this supercomputing with uh, his fast uh, uh, infinite band network but also we have uh, cloud style computing infrastructure uh, uh, the last version, the Cloud uh, 3, uh, you can see that we have more than uh, 10,000 uh, cores, 24 terabytes of memory, large storage, uh, and so on, right? Apart from that, we don't only do uh, um, high-performance computing, but we also do high performance communication in the sense that we provide with services to the, to the uh, academic institutions in Galicia, to universities, uh, to schools, etc., etc. So we manage this uh, network from, from CESCA. And we have other uh, projects that is uh, quantum in, in communications, that is quantum uh, communications, right? We are, uh, this actually will come soon, 
quantum uh, QKD, a uh, quantum key distribution uh, network between CESGA and uh, Vigo Quantum Communication Center in Vigo that are separated by, by 100 kilometers. I think it's a little bit more. Um, and yeah, this will come soon, uh, available for researchers pr for do, uh, proof of concepts and, and, and basic research. And we also have a quantum communication lab, uh, continuous variable QKD lab in our facilities. What about future infrastructures, uh, classical infrastructure, and also, well, this is a spoiler, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> the, yeah. um, well, uh, in, in the next two years, we have a budget of almost 50 million for plus taxes for infrastructure. Uh, that includes uh, another supercomputer, a new quantum computer, uh, storage, and a new data, data center to put all these machines so that we don't have more space in our current facility, right? And also the projects, the projects will include the budget for hiring some people, so maybe there are some uh, opportunities for, uh, for coming to work with us. Uh, these are the non-classical infrastructures, um, the quantum infrastructures. We have quantum infrastructures as well. Uh, why quantum? What is the potential of these technologies? So I, I will not go very deep on this, uh, but uh, just I'm making a brief summary, summary of our activities at CESGA and our interests. But yeah, uh, a new internet with unbreakable security this is a potential uh, use case of quantum uh, communications, solving problems that are intract intractable with classical computing, uh, solving very challenging problems with low energy consumption, sens sensors with extraordinary accuracy, and understanding complex quantum systems. So uh, quantum technologies are very promising. Nowadays are a very uh, prominent research topic, but there is a long way to go, right? So we are in, uh, in, in that stage. So we are leading the Galicia Quantum Technology Hub, that is a collaborative effort of all uh, Galician region. Um, basically, well, we are working together to, to, um, to, uh, to have more uh, visibility in Europe and, uh, and have more uh, impact on our research. And uh, in Galicia, we have yeah, uh, experts in, on quantum computing. Uh, this is the case of CITIUS, for example, or CESGA. We have also researchers on that, quantum communications uh, uh, and quantum sensing. Um, uh, what infrastructures uh, do we have um, regarding uh, quantum technologies? Well, we have... Uh, simulators or emulators that basically emulates or can run quantum algorithms but in classical uh, uh, technology or classical computers. We have uh, the quantum learning machine from Atos, that is 30 qubits. Um, we have also the Fujitsu quantum emulator and we have other uh, simulators and uh, frameworks uh, that are open source. Uh, we also have a quantum random number generator um, from the company QSight. Um, we are working on it, on top of, of, of it, for uh, developing a better interface and so on. And this, is, uh, is, this quantum number gener generator is based on a patent from Marcos Curti, that is a researcher from uh, the University of, of Vigo here in, in Galicia. Um, yeah, uh, users can already uh, access it. As I mentioned before, we also have the uh, link between Santiago and Vigo, 100 kilometers of quantum key distribution network. Um, and yeah, this will be very soon available. This is not working yet. We are uh, on the process of, of, uh, of acquiring it and, and, and setting it up. And then we have our... Um, most uh, famous uh, computer right now, and that is QMU. That is a 32 super, uh, it's a quantum computer, has 32 qubits, superconducting qubits. Um, yeah, um, as far as we know, is the, the quantum computer with more qubits in, in, the South, in South Europe, in uh, public institutions, as far as we know. Um, 
and, and was, uh, was put in the hands of the users like a few weeks ago. Um, and yeah, uh, users are already testing it. Well, we have a um, protocol for access it. Uh, we have some calls, and uh, there are, you can submit your project, and you also uh, are another um, way to access to do some tests that is easier, you don't have to have a big project, and, um, and so on. Yeah. This is how it looks. These are actual pictures of our computer. This is basically custom made for us. Uh, this is the first uh, kind of, of this computer. This was made by it. so the uh, um, the provider is Fujitsu, but uh, the manufacturer of, of the computer is Oxford Quantum Circuits, and they work in, in collaboration. Um, it's Coxmon technology, um, and yeah, QPU is 32 qubits, and this was funded with uh, well with federal uh, funds. Um, what else? Um, yeah. This is what are you going to see if you come on Thursday to Tesga. Uh, the computer is there. You have here the computer. My office is on top of the computer. <laughs> so I feel very uh, fortunate. Um, and yeah, and basically uh, you have um, the computer inside is in, is in vacuum and it operates a very low uh, temperature because it's a superconducting uh, quantum computer and basically you have the cryogenic system that uh, to, to control the temperature and then the control electronics to control each qubit. You need uh, three uh, cables something per, per qubit and uh, yeah, it, it, each qubit is controlled by an FPGA. Um, okay. Okay. If you have any questions, you can interrupt me actually, because I think I'm, I'm good in, on time or not. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not so good. Okay. Uh, some research and uh, uh, research projects. Uh, research projects. So we also do research, right? So uh, we participate in many. Re we. We provide services to researchers, we, we, but we also do research, and we support researchers, sometimes in a very basic, basic way, but sometimes we get involved with a lot, so researchers, researchers can benefit from our knowledge on computing, on high-performance computing. Uh, some uh, research lines is uh, high-performance, secure, and efficient computer systems, big data, applied machine learning, quantum computing, quantum communications, educational technology, Geographical information systems, earth science, and life, life science. Um, actually, we are growing in the research part of our of our center. Um, we collaborate uh, with the Galician Weather Forecasting Service uh, called Meteo Galicia. Uh, so basically, the weather, the prediction of the weather is calculated at CESGA twice uh, per day. And we also have some research projects with them. Uh, we're right now trying to, uh, to apply neural networks to, to climate and weather pre uh, forecasting and prediction. Uh, we also work on the framework, framework of Copernicus, the Earth, the Earth observation component of the European Union's, Union's space program. And basically, we calculate uh, the, the, the ocean forecasting of the EB area, that is Iberian, Biscay, Ireland, Ireland area. We have uh, people working on, on that, on CESGA. Um, we, close very, uh, we, we work very close also to, uh, the, uh, to the public health administration, to, uh, mainly with some key researchers. One of them is Angel Carracedo, that is very well known in, in our region. Um, we also, um, in our supercomputers, are done uh, many genomic analysis, clinic genomic analysis from uh, patients from the hospital. Last year were, were more than uh, 30,000 analysis, genome analysis. Um, we also participate in, these are some examples of projects, are, uh, not all of them are here, but uh, one of them is Symphonia project, is the radiation uh, risk evaluation of detrimental effects from 
radiation exposure of patients with lymphoma or brain tumor. So the goals of, of this project are develop those estimation tools for, uh, for the medication. Research on individual sensitivity to radiation, not only patients, but also doctors. Develop a novel patient risk evaluation tool, etc. Right, and this project is, is still going on. Uh, uh, will uh, uh, is four years uh, long. We also um, work on the on the Ocean Science Program, Ocean Science Program. Um, in this, this is a very large project. Uh, almost 90 research groups are involved, and the main lines are monitoring the ocean and the coast, sustainable aquaculture innovation and opportunities. And um, basically what we are doing here is the building the integrated platform of ocean data, ocean data. The data is 10 million uh, euros and for CESGA is 274, that mainly are for um, researchers and, and, and technicians. We participate also in this uh, kind of projects. This uh, is the Uchu project that is the largest simulation of the universe that was done. Actually, the, this simulation was done in, in Japan. In, in, at, that, at that time, the largest supercomputer uh, in the world. Um, um, what we did here was to move the data from Japan to here. That is a huge amount of data. So. Uh, we, we didn't uh, use like, let's say, regular techniques. We have to optimize data uh, and so on. And uh, gave, up, gave access to researchers. So we, we de developed the platform. So this data is available for researchers. Um, we also have collaborations with the industry. One example is with PINSAC, that is an industrial transform that do uh, does industrial transformation of good. And the project basically is uh, about optimizing the production line using machine learning techniques. So we have been working with them since more than five years ago. Um, they are very happy, and we are also very happy of this collaboration. Um, and quantum, so we work on quantum. Uh, we have several projects, but we have an independent group working on that. Um, and the vision from our group is that the quantum computers are going to be accelerators of certain kernels, uh, the same, in, the, in a similar way as GPUs today are accelerators of certain kernels. Probably we will need uh, still uh, classical computing, at least in the midterm, uh, and so on. So, and in the end, all quantum algorithms need a classical part. At least you need to initialize the qubits, and you need the, to read the results. So at least these two parts are classical, and will always be, probably. Um, yeah, in our group, in our research group, that is composed of more than ten people right now, are working on hybrid algorithms, parallel quantum circuits, quantum machine learning, benchmarking, integrated quantum computing in HPC. So. Uh, look on how to our finished territory or supercomputing is integrated with with Cumio, with our uh, quantum computing. And also quantum communication and QKD. We have four people, uh, uh, four researchers uh, working on, on, that, on that. This is a European project. Uh, um, also, in, uh, we are part of this consortium composed of more of 12 companies. Um, the, the goal is developing industrial applications, develop open source libraries, create a strong community um, around industrial applications for quantum computers, and develop uh, quantum computing software stacks and benchmarks. We have two researchers working on this project. Um, uh, and this is a national project called uh, Quantum Spain. Uh, we are, uh, this is the first quantum computing ecosystem in Spain. Uh, here are, this is leading by Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and the infrastructure that comes with the project is one uh, superconducting quantum computer in BSC, and three simulators of quantum computer, one of them will be in CESGA, and actually we will develop this, uh, uh, we will develop this uh, simulator in CESGA. Um, probably we will need uh, three, four people to, to, to develop this simulator. 
Um, yeah. Also, the university is involved in, in training programs and is, is very involved in this, in this uh, quantum Spain, specifically the University of Santiago. Um, yes, uh, last slide. Um, just some remarks. Uh, just for you to remember that we are the largest supercomputing center, the second largest supercomputing center in Spain. We, has the, we have the quantum computer with more qubits in the South, South Europe, so we are proud of that, and we are proud that uh, our, the researchers of our community can have access to this, uh, to this computer, to this unique infrastructure. Um, we collaborate with other institutions in research projects, so this is the core of our philosophy, right? So we, uh, we try always to, uh, we, are, we are not trying to compete with researchers, in, especially in our region, we're trying always to collaborate. And sometimes we, we are the glue that makes uh, different universities, universities to collaborate together, uh, right? So we provide, um, HPC services and support to researchers sometimes is very basic because, for example, here in situ, they, they are experts in HPC, so probably they don't need much help from us. Sometimes they need because they, we have the infrastructures and sometimes the infrastructure <coughs> fail, but uh, um, biologists probably is, doesn't have uh, uh, a large knowledge on, on computing and sometimes needs more, more support from us, for example, right? So, um, and we, we will have large investment in the next two years. Uh, we will have actually the largest investment on infrastructure in the history of SESGA since 1993. That is more than 50 million. And this will come also uh, with uh, some budget for, for um, hiring some people. So maybe we'll, we'll have some job opportunities coming soon. We cannot know yet, but yeah. Um, Thanks for your attention and the opportunity to present here. All right. So also welcome from my side, Santiago de Compostela. Actually, it's my third time here, so I'm very happy to, to be back. So yeah, my name is Gabriele Cavallaro, and I, I lead a, a simulation and data lab, uh, which work in the interdisciplinary research between AI, remote sensing, and high-performance computing. Um, I'm here actually with uh, two, uh, two of my teams, so we have Adrico Kennedy there, PhD student who just joined us, and uh, Stefano Maro Giovanni there, so feel free to talk to them uh, if you are more interested in our research. But we have also a representative from the Ulysses Computing Center, Alexander Struber over there, who actually is uh, a guru in HPC, so if you are interested to know uh, more about our machines, uh, you, I encourage you to talk to him, especially from tomorrow when you're actually going to access our supercomputer uh, in ULIC to, to, uh, to do the exercise. I'm also a visiting professor at the University of Iceland, and uh, in fact, uh, this is the, the school that actually started and it was done three times at the University of Iceland. Uh, so you see already some picture from Dora, and actually we are very happy now to, uh, to be here. So the future uh, will bring us to some other places, we will probably uh, know very soon, but I think this is the point of having such a school, moving around, and make sure that uh, we have the possibility to welcome different students from different countries and regions uh, to, to join this community which uh, uh, we started, uh, as Dora mentioned, uh, some, some years ago uh, because we, we thought that there was a need to connect people in remote sensing that are interested in using uh, uh, this kind of technology to address uh, a problem in Earth observation. So my goal here is to, to give you an overview of uh, uh, the main sponsor of this school which is the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society and um, please um, raise your hands if you heard at least once uh, about the GRSS. Okay, the majority. So for who didn't hear about, maybe the slides are for you. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, uh, the technical committees, in particular the Earth Science Informatics Technical Committee, which is basically uh, the committee that includes this working group which organized this summer school. And finally, give you again some details uh, that uh, Dora already mentioned of the activities that we do in this working group. So IEEE GRSS. So IEEE GRSS is part of IEEE, which is the largest academic and professional society, 
which has more than 400,000 members in 160 countries, so it's a very uh, an important uh, uh, academic society. And it, in it includes actually 13 uh, uh, technical societies focusing on different, uh, uh, on different subjects. And one of these is the GRSS, so the Geoscience and Sciences Society, um, which, is, um, which is part of IEEE. It was founded in 1961, and the mission is exactly this one. So try to foster uh, method technology applications that are focused on the Geoscience and Sciences Society. And we work at, uh, very, at all, let's say, uh, let's say pipeline of the uh, application by looking at earth, ocean, atmosphere, space and all kind of processing you can imagine that entail this kind of uh, data. Uh, we have more than 5,000 members uh, in 94 countries so and you know the, the objective is always to expand, to expand and be present in more countries uh, by doing uh, chapters, for example, chapters are local organization which can be established uh, in your, if you, you know, if there is no presence yet, we can establish a chapter, for example, who are just uh, people that are connected with GRSS and can promote the society, for example, by organizing these kind of events and uh, be connected with the larger community. So the Geoscience and Remote Science Society, as I mentioned, is, uh, uh, is uh, all over the world. So in order to carry over the activities, it is important to, to define pillars. And the pillars are the following. So we have publication where we, can where we have places where we can present and publish our results. Uh, we have conferences, workshop, a tutorial, like for example this school, which we, uh, we organize. We have professional activities education, which is in any way intertwined with conferences and technical activities. So technical activities are represented by these technical committees and at the moment we have eight technical committees and each committee try to focus on specific subjects uh, within Geoscience and Remote Sciences Society. Um, one of the biggest one, as you can imagine, is the image analysis and data fusion because of the boom of deep learning, uh, AI, machine learning. Um, but of course you have also uh, technical committee which are more, for example, focused on, for example, instrumentation and future technologies or, for example, take all problems like climate change. This was one of the uh, recent established one. But uh, uh, this working group uh, is actually part of Earth Science Informatics, which, uh, as the name mentioned, try really to push uh, and to connect uh, community which really want to connect informatics with kind of problems related to uh, remote sensing earth observation. So uh, about, technica, uh, about technical publication, now uh, we have many. So basically the point is that uh, once you work and you want to disseminate your results in a scientific publica publication, you can actually select uh, the most suitable journal that, that's dedicated for, uh, uh, for, for, your, for your work. Right? So you have, for example, a journal where it's more related to uh, let's say advanced and novelty in terms of methodology, for example, the transaction on geoscience and remote sensing. Oh, but if you have, for example, if you want to present more uh, an application or result done for a specific, let's say, experience uh, or mission that you do, for example, JSTARS could be the place for you. And all this is uh, available in the website, so and also if you feel free to talk to me if you're interested to know more about this uh, information. So here is a list. Uh, let's say, of motivation why you, uh, you should join uh, the Geoscience and Remote Sciences Society. Um, as I mentioned, it's all about sharing ideas and uh, basically uh, work that you do with a large community. Um, you, of course, being a part of this community, you also get discounts. For example, when you go to a conference like the, our main conference, uh, IGARS, which this year will be in Athens, you can actually get a discount by being part of uh, uh, IEEE GRSS. Um, as I mentioned, you can actually uh, be part of the community and actually get money to organize events. So if you really want to, you're for a country that you believe that, for example, geoscience and remote sensing, or let's say this kind of you know, research is not well connected, you can actually be an actor, be there, be having you know, representative from GRSS and, uh, uh, and do uh, basically what you do here, for example. Um, and other, other, of course, other, other motivations, but uh, basically it's all about, uh, I would say, co com, you know, connecting, uh, connecting us uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this community. 
So you can also have a look uh, to this um, to this website. This is basically to join the community in JRSS. And but also maybe uh, more interesting for learning more about it is to join our e uh, electronic newsletter where you receive more information of all the different activities that are related to, uh, to this community. So, let me now enter into details about the technical committee. Um, so, as I mentioned, we are here, we are part of the Earth Science Informatics, and this committee is now uh, represented by um, uh, three chairs, uh, Manil Maske, who will come uh, tonight, tomorrow, <laughs> actually may, may be present tonight at the, at the dinner, uh, who is from NASA, uh, then we have Peter Baumann and myself uh, that co that co-chair this uh, uh, committee. And again, this is about lit literally bringing, uh, pushing the technology in terms of informatics uh, for uh, for earth observation and remote sensing. And we have also Jerica, which is helping us a lot uh, uh, in uh, in orga organizing uh, all our activities and putting together uh, all the information uh, to to continue. So one. One of the activities we do are uh, webinars, and here you see two of the latest webinars. One was about uh, VIDA, which is an open interoperable platform for earth science. And I think if you want to know more, you feel free to talk to Iksha and Kumar there. Um, and also we had a recent webinar on uh, the new, one of the new working group uh, on foundation model. So you find these uh, videos online, so you can actually have a look to them. Here you will find the link. And as Dora mentioned, um, the Earth Science Informatics includes three working groups. Um, so we are here, but uh, we have also uh, databases in remote sensing. And here we have Kumar there, if you want to know more about the, the working group, talk to him. Uh, and then uh, the latest one is uh, AI Foundation Models and Digital Twins for Geoscience, which is one prominent topic um, that uh, we felt that was important to, to represent also in this, in this technical committee. And uh, again, here you can talk to uh, to Manil if you want to know more, or anyway, the representative that will teach tomorrow the uh, the class. So this last was already shown, so you can join us. Basically, just go into this link. And now let me just conclude before we go to the coffee break, which I think everyone really is looking for about the group. Um, so this school, as mentioned by Dora, is really trying to connect this uh, community and try to you know consider different computing technology and see how this can be useful apply for. Uh, problems in earth observation or remote sensing. So um, this is the idea. Um, we will be present uh, in IGARS, so in Athens, and with different activities. One would be uh, a tutorial, uh, a basically, a, I would say, compressed version of what will be done uh, in the next days, uh, but probably with novel, with different models, right? So foundation models. Uh, so you can still uh, subscribe because for tutorials, I think, you can even join the day before the beginning of the conference, so you can really check and decide if it's something that is for you. But also we are uh, con uh, organizing an uh, invited session, which means that we take all the topic and we invite speakers to submit the paper, and then we have it there uh, during the conference. And this year we will have three, one more related to general scalable parallel computing remote sensing, and two more on, uh, on quantum computing. We also have uh, collaboration across technical uh, committees, as you can see here. Um, it is so, as I mentioned here, we are. Um, let me come back here. So we are different committees, but it doesn't mean that we just work independently in our silos. Actually, it's important that whenever we find an opportunity to co to cooperate between these uh, committees, we do it because I think that's the whole point. Actually, then to to bring topics forward. And for example, here we have one activity. This is a workshop that is more related on um, uh, finding effective ways of searching and storing and utilizing vast of complex geospatial data from diverse sources. And basically, here we organize a workshop uh, in conjunction with the uh, ICM uh, SIG Spatial International uh, Conference, which was in Hamburg in 2023. So, this was a cooperation between uh, our technical uh, committee and uh, IIDF. Then we have, for example, another activity. This was a, a workshop which organized at the Arctic Assembly, which is one of the largest uh, assembly that is done in the, in the North countries to take all, all the problems related to the Arctic polar region. And for example, here we organize a session together. We react with the technical, the, the technical 
committee which uh, is more the focus on climate change. And whenever we do this activity, we always try to put material online available so you can always you know, come back and have a look to it. Uh, we recently also had the tutorial on quantum computing for earth observation. This was done uh, in the M2 GARS, which is one of the regional conferences uh, um, organized by GRSS. So this was done in Oran, Algeria. Uh, and also in this case, you will find you know, uh, the material. This was one hour tutorial, so very complex, but at least, let's say, uh, bringing these also in, you know, topics in, uh, in the regions that uh, maybe the technology is not, let's say, or well present or well represented. And with this, I conclude here. So uh, please, uh, let's stay in touch. We are here for until Friday, so it's going to be a long, uh, long week, right? Uh, I think I was already in touch with you by email when we did the registration, so I think I might still remember your name. <laughs> but in any case, uh, we will talk uh, over this, uh, this nice week, and basically now yeah. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks to you, Dora. Uh, thanks uh, for organizing the school, but also for the gentle introduction. Thanks also to Gabriele to for inviting me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. I am uh, very happy to, to be with you, only virtually. I'm, I'm sorry uh, not to be uh, there with you. But uh, that actually, I'm, I mean, many things going, but also I mean, I'm a bit sick, so my voice uh, will be a bit uh, shaking, maybe. So actually, being sick is better if I'm not uh, with you today. But uh, I, I hope that you will enjoy this talk. So uh, what I will discuss is uh, quantum computing for our observation. On, uh, this is a quite new field. So I will uh, give you a um, kind of status of uh, the advances of the, the last years, but also giving a, a few directions about the, the current research in that field. So uh, first. Let's start with why being interested in, uh, in quantum computing for us observation now? For a few reasons. First, that's, uh, the first one, like many, uh, for, for many other fields, is that uh, quantum computing has reached uh, a mature uh, state. Uh, indeed, we have now quantum devices with many qubits. I mean, the, the first qubit physical qubit was created around the uh, year 2000, so 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, it's very recent, but now we have, and we can see that from the roadmaps of the, the large manufacturers like IBM, Google, and so on, that we have reached 500, 1000 maybe soon uh, qubits. So we can do things with those devices. And actually, even in the software on application industry, they are looking at that. And they, they are looking at, uh, at quantum computing, but also quantum annealing, which has been a product for running computations for many years now, uh, as the D-Wave company. So there are lots of things that can be done, not only just having a quantum computer, but running compute on quantum devices. And this can be used maybe soon uh, for quantum simulation in chemistry, in, uh, in materials, uh, and hopefully also in earth observation. One other great reason why uh, to, to get interested in that field uh, is that actually we are in Europe uh, right now, uh, even if uh, I prepare and I know that the audience today is uh, international, more than European. But in Europe, for instance, we have uh, the European Commission that is sponsoring uh, the, the development of science uh, because we have this kind of long-term objectives like building a digital society or also the Green Deal, which is uh, I mean, how we can uh, uh, continue to evolve and to develop technologies on the society, but with respect of the environment, taking into account maybe the, the climate change and trying to mitigate this effect. And we have two uh, flagship programs. One is uh, the quantum flagship, 
with lots of uh, development in quantum. Really, the, the objective is to build quantum computers in Europe. Uh, we have also other uh, flagship programs like Destination Earth. Uh, Destination Earth Initiative has uh, the objective, the goal of building a digital twin of the Earth, uh, enabling uh, people, policymakers, scientists, to, to model the Earth, so that we do that already with our science and uh, observation, but also to simulate possible scenarios for instance, with uh, uh, some forcing of uh, initial conditions on policies made uh, into practice, what would be the impact uh, in year 2050, 2100, uh, 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 on the climate, on, on our environment? And those two flagship programs, actually, they are also very close together because they are addressing different uh, goals but are running on the same infrastructure. So likely, we will have to, to merge them at some point. This is uh, also why um, uh, in the last four years, in the last four years I was with uh, the European Space Agency, in particular uh, in the, the FILAB, and um, what I tried to develop there was actually this quantum computing for you uh, thing, that is to develop an ecosystem on the kind of market, because everything is business, but also uh, new science at the intersection of both fields. And uh, what we did is first to, to build a network between lots of people, students like yourself, universities, organizations like the ACCP, um, but also ALIS, uh, lots of organizations around the, in Europe and in the world. Uh, industries, of course, we have uh, big tech like IBM, Continuum, some are based in, uh, in Europe like uh, IQM Computing or uh, others, um, supercomputers with uh, Julish, Shineka and others. And with all these partners, we try really to, to build uh, an ecosystem of people who are aware of both problematics. On one thing that we did, especially, was to, to try with uh, this, uh, these two consortia of, um, of experts to, to define roadmaps for the future development for the next uh, 15 years of uh, what could be the, uh, the Earth observation use cases which could be interesting for, uh, for quantum computing, where we could get maybe something that, uh, that is uh, useful and uh, more efficient when quantum computers are, uh, let's say, operational. And here I have also to, to maybe to, to take a step back in order to, uh, to explain uh, a bit the, the various lines of research that can exist in quantum computing, or quantum computing for EO. Of course, there is academic research. Uh, I listed a few of the, the challenges of today. People are still developing quantum devices because this is something that is not uh, defined for sure now. But also, for instance, now error correction is uh, the main thing because we have qubits, but they are faulty. So we, we have to develop further tolerant quantum computing to reach something that is uh, acceptable in a digital world. Developing new algorithms, of course. On the industry side, of, uh, on the contrary, the, everything is driven by markets and by applications, use cases. So, of course, we have the big manufacturers who are still uh, developing quantum devices uh, and trying to sell it to some users. So, of course, there is this qubit race. There is also the quantum advantage race because they have to, I mean, to sell something, you have to claim advantage, at least a, a kind of a, a prominent position on the market. People are trying also to develop industrial use cases. And this is exactly actually what uh, we could do also in quantum computing for you. Uh, find use cases which could have a, an interest on, on the market. Of course, if you compare 
a supercomputer and a current uh, quantum device, it's not for today, it's not for tomorrow neither, maybe in a few years. And what is very important is already to build this ecosystem. So you see there are different perspectives, and actually there is a, a bit of chasm between, uh, between both. Um, everything we present today actually is uh, sometimes uh, in one category, sometimes in one other, but actually trying to bridge this, uh, this chasm. So, to give you the outline of the talk, so motivation and status, this is what I already said. Now I will show you uh, a bit uh, the, the kind of research sprints and the, the first exploratory activities that we had in the, in the last years. Uh, then I will uh, focus on quantum machine learning on the, the recent developments we had with, uh, with various groups. And uh, finally, I will uh, try to, to present uh, current challenges uh, in order to, to show you maybe some directions that uh, researchers in Europe mostly are, uh, are trying to, to follow right now. And the, the objective is uh, to give you also an overview of uh, all the research questions that uh, we asked ourselves, also th that evolved, and now we, we change a bit uh, our approach, we learn some stuff, but now we have also, of course, new research questions to, to ask ourselves. So, first, uh, early steps in uh, QC4U. So, uh, here, of course, when we started, so the first question was uh, already um, to, to ask us, is there any Earth observation thing that we could do with quantum physics or quantum computing? Because quantum computing is suitable for, uh, for quantum physics, of course. So the answer is no. We have EO data, which are large scale, not in report with, I mean, we are not doing chemistry, so basically we have uh, big data. And QC4U is uh, about applying quantum computing to classical data. Now, the question we had was uh, to understand the potential of the quantum algorithms, understand the difference between the, the various hardwares, uh, how to use the current. Uh, quantum devices, so in the NISC area, in the noisy area, uh, to how we can apply that to, to the big real-life use cases in our observation. And one question that we were asking, but also that all my managers, all the people I was interacting with were asking to us, where can we have an advantage with quantum computing? Which is actually completely the wrong way to ask the question, because the, the good way would be how to define what is a quantum advantage. And this is what we will see in the next, uh, let's see, in the next examples. So first we had, uh, I mean, we learn by doing, because uh, this is, I mean, the way that you, you get uh, experience. So first thing we, we picked, for instance, EO classification, association classification, land cover, and we try to, to use uh, some kind of quantum machine learning to classify uh, on cover. And for this, first, what we learned is that you have to, to have this kind of hybrid architecture, hybrid between classical neural networks, for instance, on some part of the neural network, which is uh, modeled on a quantum device. And actually, we had quite nice um, results, likely by chance, but uh, we showed that this kind of hybrid architecture was able to do quite better than the, the, the classical counterpart with the same number of parameters. One reason for that, that we uh, tried to investigate with uh, Suyun Chang at, at CERN, was that maybe because you are using qubits instead of bits, the, the basic unit is projecting the, um, the data in a representation space that is more expressive. Another question we had, was, for instance, how can we build end-to-end -end, um, uh, pipelines from EO data to a solution, and how can we compare 
various kinds of, um, of quantum devices. And we had these two parallel experiments, one with uh, Arthur Merchandy in Poland, the other one with Amir Delil Basic in, uh, in Germany. And we, we are trying to do some kind of uh, classification also with quantum SVM. But in one case, circuit-based SVM, so kind of uh, superconducting uh, IBM-like uh, uh, implementation. And the other one with uh, quantum annealer, the one, the first quantum annealer that has been deployed at uh, Julie Supercomputer Center. And actually, the answer is that first, we are able to find tricks to reduce the quantity of data and to find, actually, stuff that, uh, that works. Uh, so good proof of concept, it is possible to do that. Actually, different quantum devices have also different kind of advantages. Uh, <clears throat> and in both cases, actually, we are quite happy with that. Not enough, anyway, to, I mean, just to, to say that this is a solution. But another kind, for instance, also of uh, quantum devices we tested, this, kind, this time with uh, Michal Shimasko at University of Warsaw, was uh, the, the photonics uh, device, continuous variable uh, quantum computing. On this, actually, here we really started to think that uh, the quantum advantage is, uh, is maybe not just uh, a matter of speed or a matter of doing better than what is uh, existing, because actually it's very difficult to, to beat, uh, to do better than the um, the current uh, big neural networks. Um, but maybe the advantage was, for instance, to, to look at the training time. And uh, here, for instance, for recurrent neural networks, we have this uh, very nice uh, proof concept showing that we are able to have convergence very, uh, very quicker, uh, very much quicker than with the classical uh, recurrent neural networks. Now I will move to uh, actually the, the follow-up of that. Uh, so still in quantum machine learning, but the specific uh, field which is geometric quantum machine learning. So in geometric uh, machine learning, but also geometric quantum machine learning, the, the objective is to bring invariance and equivariance uh, to the networks. So actually, uh, and very successful attempts on what is uh, the theoretical reason, likely why convolutional neural networks were so efficient in the, in the recent years, is because they are able to, to extract information, spatially relevant uh, information, in a, in a very efficient manner. So the idea was, how can we try to include this kind of properties uh, on uh, in quantum neural networks, so the one we are investigating. And also this, of course, could be, because we have always this gap between the size of the data we have and the size of the quantum devices, uh, to, to reach something more efficient. So first we had uh, this work on quantum evolutional neural networks, so you understand from the the pun on words that this is the quantum version of convolutional neural networks. Um, that we are, um, we did lots of tests here. This was led by uh, Alessandro Sebastianelli, but also uh, we had uh, Francesco Moro and Giulia Ciavatti from, uh, from Italy working on this, uh, on this project. And here we are using convolutional neural networks for feature extraction, so learning representations from the data, and then we use this representation in many ways for many kinds of uh, applications. And what we see, and you can see that on the, the graphs here, that actually the, the way they are projected in the, the representation space is actually already better, uh, better uh, it suits better the, the the downstream tasks, so if you want to classify them, actually you can classify them much easier. Way. And this is why actually, for instance, on the, the famous Eurosat dataset, which is a very easy dataset uh, to, to perform classification in, um, in Earth observation, 
Here, if we compare with uh, supervised approach, actually we were able to, uh, to reach the same kind of performances by doing the, uh, the feature extraction, the representation learning, and then just uh, simple clustering. So it means that actually the, the representation is already uh, a good one for uh, understanding the data. About equivariant quantum neural networks, uh, on this, one, this time with uh, Su Yun Chang uh, at CERN on the EPFM in Switzerland, uh, we try to, to bring actually the same kind of uh, equivalence, so equivalence rotations, for instance, in the, the P4M uh, group. Uh, and we build the uh, ad hoc circuits which are able to, to have this kind of, um, of properties. And what we've shown is that uh, actually we have also here an increased generalization power, which is, I mean, this is a goal of geometric machine learning, so we are happy with that. And what is important is that it's able to learn with less samples, as you can see uh, on the graph. Or the we reach much sooner the good performances with uh, the equivalent neural network. This works also to uh, another kind of uh, AI, which is generative AI, generative machine learning. So you know that because maybe you are using mid-journey or stable diffusion. Uh, the thing is that generative modeling means that you are trying to model the distribution of the data, which is a bit different from, uh, for instance, just classification of data, where you are usually trying to model the posterior distribution of the classes with respect to the data, which is actually a simpler case. What has been done so far is discriminative modeling, so this kind of uh, supervised posterior um, classification task or modeling task. Generative modeling is, uh, is bringing also uh, an issue uh, on a challenge to uh, standard AI, because basically you, have, you need lots tons of samples to train, you need very big networks, and of course you need huge compute means to train that. Uh, so actually, even the standard AI could reach here a plateau because uh, we are not able to, to train that. So maybe at some point we will need some kind of computing devices that are able to learn faster from uh, less samples. And here you see a bit the connection with, with what I just presented. And we try actually to, uh, to train various kind of, uh, to develop various kind of um, algorithms. So the first one is uh, the famous uh, generative adversarial networks. There was uh, already proof of concept of a discrete quantum GAN developed by uh, IBM, uh, Krista Zufal, a few years ago. What we did with uh, Su Yun Chang and the uh, Sphere of Laker Sarah, Michael Grossi at CERN was to develop a, a continuum quantum GAN. So, continuum means just that you are really modeling the, uh, the distribution of images and you are able to uh, extract an infinite number of images from this, uh, this distribution that you just model. Uh, for that, we use the latent space embedding. That is, actually, we are not applying directly, we are working directly in the image space, but we, uh, we create, we learn with a standard encoder to, to go in a latent space where images are represented by codes, embeddings, and then we are uh, learning that uh, with, uh, with quantum devices. Here you can see different kind of um, of of results we had, a comparison between a classical GAN and uh, our approach, the last QGAN. Actually, you can see that on NIST, on Fashion NIST, uh, and also on SAT4, which is a national vision data set, we obtain, with the same number of parameters, or even less, equivalent results. And also here, uh, the thing is that uh, the, the results are learned actually much uh, with, with the with less sample on a shorter time, less epochs. Then with another group, 
Francesco, Francesca De Falco, and, uh, Andrea Ceschini and Massimo Panella La Sapienza uh, in Rome, uh, Alessandro Sebastiani, Sebastian Lee at uh, Fila at the European Space Agency. We also tried to develop diffusion, quantum diffusion models. First thing we did was actually to develop quantum hybrid diffusion models. So I hope you know what is a diffusion model, basically this is things behind uh, mid-journey or stable diffusion. And it works like this, that is by, basically you, you are able to go quite easily by adding noise from an image to pure noise. And actually what you learn to do is uh, the reverse process. So you learn to denoise from complete noise to less noisy to, uh, to images that are uh, real images. And by starting with different random noise, you actually are able to synthesize uh, different kind of images. Here what he did is that the denoising network is an hybrid, hybrid uh, classical quantum, various kind of interventions that we use. And here you can see uh, the results we have. So how to read this figure? Uh, number of epochs is uh, in abscess. So here we have one epoch, 10 epochs, 20 epochs. And here we have various kind, here classical on the left. On the, the more we go on the right, we have more and more quantum embedded. And actually, the result we observed, and it's very interesting, is that with, if, especially if you look at the middle row, we have actually better results with the quantum version with only 10 epochs. So it means that we learn faster to do better things. And also, all the, the scores are better. Of course, if you give enough time, uh, we obtain more or less the same results. But what it means is that we are able to learn faster. On that, and the reason for that maybe is that just comes from the fact that we have qubits instead of bits. So it means that the, the, the basic unit for storing the information is more complex. So actually, most of the effort is done during the data representation part, but then the learning comes, uh, comes quicker. We involved and we, we did another thing using the trick of uh, the Latin of coding of before. And uh, for this, actually, we project in the uh, latent space. This was also the, the trick behind uh, the stable diffusion, the wrong back paper at CPR 2022, uh, by the way. 2022. Uh, and actually, here, all of our denosing, um, uh, so the diffusion process in that case is run on the, in the latent space, so on codes, embeddings of images. And we are able to denoise a pure quantum denoiser. And here also, this works well. This is the first proof of concept of a, a quantum latent diffusion model. And here we have also the same kind of results that we are able to, to learn uh, with less epochs, but also with less samples. Uh, that is, we have always better results on uh, better losses when we when we do that. So this actually uh, is likely, I mean, this is in relation to, to carry on, of course, but uh, there is very good hints uh, also reproduced uh, all over the world by many groups, also the Los Alamos groups, among uh, uh, others, that actually we can have this kind of speed up in the learning in, in quantum machine learning. So, my last part, or maybe I try to, to be a bit quicker, um, is that what are the challenges now and what are the research questions now? And I will illustrate that with a, a few things. So, for instance, in quantum machine learning, we have optimization. This is actually a research problem on, in the quantum machine learning literature. You always read of barren plateaus. We have a word about that. Other kind of Algorithms. Uh, and so beyond quantum machine learning, there are also maybe other kind of algorithms that we can uh, do. Uh, we have seen that we can have hybrid classical uh, quantum networks, but how can we do even better? And have that, for instance, supercomputer or modular quantum 
the supercomputing, what kind of earth related equations can be modeled, and what kind of other advantages. There will be always this quest for the, the infamous quantum advantage. We have seen that the quantum advantage is not only a speed up, not only a complexity reduction, and actually maybe energy efficiency could be one of them. So a few examples of uh, current work. So these uh, uh, are really recent or uh, will be presented in various conferences uh, this year. Uh, for instance, with uh, uh, Suyun Chang on the Sabun Tunnel Sleep uh, at CERN, uh, we had uh, the study of the, the last few games that I just presented. Um, we, we try to model how actually uh, we can have, during the optimization of these circuits, uh, barren plateaus. So barren plateaus, actually, uh, the term is very specific to quantum machine learning, but it was known uh, 20 years ago as vanishing radiance in standard machine learning. Basically, this is the same that if you try to optimize by gradient descent a flat landscape, you cannot actually optimize because all the gradients are zero, vanishing. So one way to monitor that is actually to monitor the loss of uh, that, that you are trying to, um, uh, to optimize, to reduce. And we've seen that actually we are, obtained to, we are able to obtain some, some uh, certitude that we are not in that kind of optimization. So we, we, we are not in the, the dead part of, uh, of the thing. And uh, except maybe for some kind of circuits and some, or some kind of circuits plus optimizers. In another work, uh, which was presented last year uh, at QTML, uh, on part of the Open uh, Quantum Software uh, Foundation project, we compare also various kinds of optimizers uh, for, uh, for optimizing convolutional neural networks and we, we seen that uh, several of them were also uh, less adapted. Some, some of them were, were less adapted. So with all these kind of things, actually, you can have a way to monitor that you are not in a vanishing gradient uh, scale. Another example, quantum graph neural networks, uh, is answering two research questions, new algorithms, quantum graph neural networks, quite clear but also uh, for modeling another kind of Earth-based question, which is actually the climate interactions, because actually quantum is all about interactions. Actually, quantum is moving from uh, I have one atom and another atom to consider that uh, the interaction between atoms. And here also, basically, to model interaction, maybe uh, quantum uh, computing can be useful. And this is what we, we try with this uh, quantum graph neural network implementation called uh, Graphino. And actually, we had uh, very nice results here, uh, obtained by Francesco Mauro and uh, Alessandra Sebastianelli. And actually, we have state-of-the-art results. So with this simulation of this hybrid quantum graph neural network, which means what? which means that actually there is something to, to dig in in quantum uh, computing, even if simulated, actually. Uh, now the next step is, of course, to go to a real hardware implementation, but also to understand why we have this, uh, these better results. But this actually will be presented at IGARS uh, in, uh, in July in Athens. Another kind of works we are doing this time with uh, Amer Delil Basic uh, and uh, Gabriele Cavallaro at uh, Jewish uh, is how we can optimize the modeling of software and hardware. And here we go big times because we are using a supercomputer with quantum device like uh, the D-Wave Vanilleur, also maybe others in the, in the future. And we apply that on a very combinatorial problem, which is mission planning, that is what kind of regions on the Earth could I take a picture of with my uh, satellite, or maybe my constellation of satellites uh, circling or, uh, in, the, in space around the Earth. Um, this also will be presented at IGARS uh, in Athens. So if you go there, uh, make sure to discuss with, uh, with Amer, David Basis, and with Francesco for the other.
for the other uh, talk. On the, my last slides, what other advantages could be uh, studied? Uh, I discussed a few one. One which is actually very interesting is also uh, the energy efficiency, because basically if we are able to to learn faster or to run uh, less tasks to do the same thing, actually there will be uh, less uh, compute cost, and uh, of course, by cons consequently less impact on the resources. And for that, we use uh, various kind of quantum resource estimation that is basically counting the complexity, but not only, uh, because uh, it's not only the theoretical complexity that's important, but also to find the kind of heuristics and the kind of combination of use cases and uh, algorithms where you don't have something that grows exponentially complex, uh, in terms of complexity, in real complexity, that is, more the statistic complexity than the, the theoretical one, the theoretical upper bound. This work is uh, led by uh, Arthur Miroshuski. Arthur actually is already uh, at the summer school, so please ask him uh, some more detail. Now it's time to finish. I wanted to show you the, the faces of the, the brilliant people I'm working with uh, all over Europe, in Poland, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, and so on. Um, also, of course, uh, lots of collaborators uh, University professors, researchers uh, in CERN, La Sapienza, Jewish, uh, University of Warsaw, and so on. Also in industries like KP Labs. And uh, of course, I mean, kudos to them for the great work. If you have questions, I'm sorry not being here, but do not hesitate to drop me an email, bls at i3p.org. Uh, I will be very happy to answer a question. Discuss with the people who are there, Arthur, Gabriele, maybe, if you have questions uh, or common work. And uh, if you have a few questions now, I can answer them. We are going to start now uh, with a practical session that uh, we prepare with Google FNG. I'm going to uh, work uh, with it, and Alvaro is going to be around you. Uh, if you have uh, problems with the account or you have error problems or whatever, you can uh, up the hand and, and then he's going to help you, okay? So in this case, um, we are going to... ¿Quieres hacerlo más grande? Uh, we are going to load a, a Landsat 8 image collection. So if we don't know the ID, the identifi uh, identificator of the image collection, we can look in the research uh, 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 bar and appears different type of uh, Landsat uh, options. You can note it also that I type in Landsat 8 and, uh, and appear Landsat 7. Mm -hmm. It seems a little bit back sometimes in the in the researcher, but uh, we can scroll a little bit down and we are going to look a specific uh, image collection which is called uh, here. Uh, what is it? Uh, here, Landsat Eight Level Two Collection Two Tier One. Okay, if you click there. You can visualize the information of the image collection, and you can here see uh, you can see here the ID, the identificator of the image collection. You can copy and paste from this from here, or you can click in import. The two different ways to load an image collection is like that. Uh, not needed uh, copy. You can uh, took whatever option. If you import directly, it's going to appear here on the top. If you did an import, uh, if you copy and paste, you only need to copy and paste here, okay? So we have an image collection there. As uh, we told us before, if I run the script now, nothing happened. Well, well you <laughs> <laughs> Ah, because I have a syntax uh, error, sorry. Now, yes. And uh, nothing happened. No, no, I don't have any error. <laughs> so the cloud didn't do anything. Cloud didn't look for the Landsat 8 at some point. Uh, if we print what we have in the variable, in uh, IC variable, 
we are going to get an error because we are going to try to load more than 5,000 5, images uh, uh, in, in one step, and it is not possible to print, to visualize that quantity of information. So one thing that we are going to do is reduce over the timing. We are going to uh, take the image collection and we are going to use a filter which is called filter date. With filter date, if you don't know, you can go to the uh, documentation and uh, you can look in the uh, search bar and look for filter date. And you can see the information of that function. You have uh, the descriptions, is telling you that uh, these two dots is the collection, so this is the part that has to be in front of the function. Then you put it dot, the name of the function, and you have to add the rest of the inputs that you have there. So in that case, is, uh, you need to uh, define a starting and ending uh, date in order to filter the collection. So in this case, we can filter the collection considering uh, a date uh, from 2000. 2011, uh, we are going to select from January, 1st of January. This is the order that you need to follow, year, uh, month, and uh, day, okay? This is the starting point that our image collection is going to take, and we are going to move till 2012. So we can type in 2022, and we are going to finish in September 13th, for instance, I don't know. As you, as you prefer. You miss a comma in the middle. Ah, sorry, I miss it a comma here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, with that, we reduce the number of images. But you need to also consider that uh, now we are going to load global scale. <laughs> so, even if it is a short time range, we, we are going to try to load more than 5,000 elements. So let's try to reduce the uh, spatial cover of the Landsat. In that case, we can define uh, uh, geometries in order to uh, load the images that overlap the geometry. There are different ways to, uh, there are different types of geometry, as I commented before, points, lines, uh, polygons, multi-polygons, etc. We are going to define a polygon, uh, a point, sorry, simple, just one point. So to do that, uh, we are going to define a point in Valencia, uh, which is our region. <laughs> and uh, we are going to use the function ee.geometryPoint. And the reason why we choose Valencia is because Santiago de Compostela was full of clouds most yes. of the time. <laughs> <laughs> we tried. <laughs> we, we wanted to do the example uh, here, but it was <laughs> quite complicated. You are going to see that time to time in Valencia also there, is, there are clouds. <laughs> but <laughs> much less <laughs> than here in Santiago. So in order to define a point, we need to use the square uh, brackets, first of all. And the order of the information that we need to provide is, first of all, the longitude and then the latitude. So in that case, Valencia is kind of... Uh, this one, yeah. It's kind of uh, 0 0.378 uh, as a longitude and 39.528 uh, as a uh, latitude. So this is a, a, a point. We can visualize our point if we want it in the map. Let's try to do that because it's simple. In order to visualize uh, objects in, in the map, and um, in most of the cases, I think all of the cases are uh, or futures or images or future collections or image collections, you need to use the function map. Map dot at layer. The add layer with two this, to this. Oops. Oh. Yeah. With that, uh, we are telling the system that we want to add an object in our a layer in our map. And in this case, we have a name uh, which is a DLC, and then copy and paste. We can directly uh, put the name. If we do that and we run, I'm in United States, so I'm not going to see my point. I need to go, I need to move and go to uh, the area. And you can see that I have a black dot in Valencia, okay? This is the point that already uh, uh, visualized. 
uh, can happen because every time that you open Google Earth Engine, the map is, is focused in the United States for um, developing reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you wanted to go directly to other area, as uh, is our case now that we wanted to visualize our point in Valencia, you can center the map. So in that case, we can put it before map uh, center object, cent center object, and then we can put the name of our variable. And you can add a zoom, zoom level. We can try it with 14 and let's see how, uh, what is happening with a zoom of 14. Yeah, and I make a typo here because it's something like that. So in this case, you can note it that we go directly to the point that we wanted to visualize when you run again the script, okay? If the zoom is too high, you can move it. Uh, I think uh, higher values uh, zoom in um, is more zoom in, lower values is uh, zoom out, okay? So once we have the uh, point, we are going to select in our image collection, in our IC, uh, the images that overlap that geometry, that point. In order to do that, we need to use the function filter bones. So in this case, we are going to have ic.filterbones. Yeah, is uh, here. Yeah. And we need to tell which geometry we wanted to overlap uh, our images, which are the geometry that we are going to use. In this case, it's our point. So uh, we type in. And now, Let's try to see how many images we have in that image collection. I don't know nowadays uh, uh, how many I have. We can print, we can visualize in the console the number of images that we have using the function size. If we run that, now it's doing something, Google Earth Engine, which is printing uh, the number of images that we have. In this case, it's telling us that we have 306 different tiles. Which ones? Mm -hmm. Relative, because that depends on our uh, geometry. We can do one thing. We can visualize the image collection that we already have it in order to see what we are going to use, okay? So again, in this case, we use also uh, at layer, map dot at layer, and we use the name of our image collection. If I do that, and I run my script, okay, sometimes happen these things, <laughs> we can see that it's loading things. I'm going to scroll out, zoom out. So we are loading, uh, I think that uh, some tiles, different tiles of uh, Landsat. All these tiles are different, but all of them overlap the geometry that we defined before. We can note it that uh, the images now you can also you can see you can see that we have clouds in Valencia, by the way, <laughs> already. But uh, we don't know what are behind the clouds because all of it are in black. We can define uh, colors, uh, RGB colors, uh, RGB composite, or we can define a full, uh, false color composite. There are different ways to do that. If you don't know anything about the colors and the bands and anything in, in, in the application, first of all, you need to go again to the, to the information of the image collection in order to know which are the RGB bands of Landsat. Once you know that, you can open the layers and you can see two layers. If I unclick the second one, my image is going to disappear because the layer one is the point is following the same order that you have in the script. So you can activate the layer two, which is our images, and then you have a wheel here, icon wheel, that you can open. Yeah? Yes. Uh, but uh, the, the menu is going to be more or less equal. Yeah. Like that? Okay. So in this case, uh, we are using uh, Landsat, and uh, we need to. Uh, we wanted to uh, create a RGB composite, uh, uh, real colors that we wanted to see. So we can open here. The, this is the three bands that we are going to use as uh, red, green, and, and blue. 
And we need to select the band which is the red band in Landsat. In Landsat is the band 4, so you can select there. Then uh, is the band 3 and the band 2. And you need to consider one thing. The, uh, uh, um, some uh, images, some, uh, some uh, image collections are scaling and others not. There are a scaling factor. All that information, it is in the uh, uh, image collection description. And you can see if this image collection, I'm going to look for, uh, directly for the image collection. Let's see if this is going to work. And appears the image collection that I want. Yes. You can see here in the bands, the information of the, I'm going to open this, because if not, we cannot see anything. And you have here the information of the, of the image collection, and you have here the information of the bands. These images must be a scale, and I didn't scale. So the reflectance values are not going to be between 0 and 1. Okay? So you need to know that information in order to plot uh, the images when, when you want to visualize uh, uh, well the images, if you scale or not the images. For this reason, as I didn't scale, I'm going to put a minimum value of 5,000 and a maximum value of 25,000 because I didn't scale the images. I didn't do anything in the images. Just for visualization purpose. Okay? Yeah. And uh, yeah, because now also. <laughs> Can I do something like that <laughs> and apply? <laughs> so you click in apply, and now you can see that we can see the image in RGB, okay? RGB colors. Now we have spent time doing this uh, uh, visualization, and if we run the code again, we are going to lose all the parameters that we put it in the menu. So in order to avoid that uh, every time that we run uh, and change the parameters every time in the menu, we can import. If you click in import, appears the visualization, visualization parameters here. And this is the code which you should create when you want it to visualize an image and you don't want it to change the parameters every time that you run the code, okay? Once you have import the visualization parameters, if I run here, I'm going to close this, if I run the script again, you are going to notice that my image is going to be black again, okay? Because I didn't use the visualization parameters. I need to use them, and to use them, you have to put them in the map layer information, uh, function as an input. In that case, when you run the code, now we don't have the problems to uh, select again the visualization parameters because we have in the, in the script. Okay. Until here, everything okay? You scale the spectral information or the, uh, the spatial information? I, I didn't scale the spectral information. The reflectance values are between uh, 0 and okay. uh, 65,000 okay. or something okay. like that. Yeah. For for that for that I have these uh, values in the in the visualizations twenty five thousand and five thousand. Okay. Yeah, she has just scaled the representation values to be visible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But no any processing, no any scaling in the in the data itself. It's just the raw and yeah the, the high histogram is kind of compressed just to see it like yeah. in a, like a photo or RGB. Yeah, you can see what you have there. Well, in this case, we have images and we have clouds in the, in the area. Yeah? Can you repeat how did you open the dialogue? Yeah, you have here uh, layers, and in the layers you have a wheel icon there, and then appears the menu. Yeah? So, now we have an uh, image collection uh, which uh, has uh, different timing acquisitions uh, in a specific time range. We are going to do a very simple operation which is reduce all the image collection in one image calculating the, mm, the median of the temporal series. Okay? So in that case, 
There are different ways to do that uh, in, in Google Earth Engine. Uh, if you use basic uh, statistical uh, measures as median, median, uh, maximum, minimum, uh, by default, they are already predefined. If you don't have predefined the uh, functions uh, uh, as dot .min, dot .maximum, dot, dot .max, dot .min, you have to uh, use the function reducer, so you use the image collection, dot .reducer, and then look in the reducer menu in the documentation, the reducers functions that you have, and you can select which one you want, because there are different type of reducers that you can apply to your image collection. In this case, as we are going to use a very simple uh, and, and really common uh, statistical measure, we can use directly the function dot .min, dot .median, dot .maximum, okay? And we are going to do that. In this case, I'm going to calculate the median to my image collection, so I apply the median function. And I don't put any um, I don't put any input there. I don't need it. The system understands that I wanted to calculate the median of that image collection. As I commented, there are some functions that uh, doesn't appear as a median or as a maximum uh, directly in the name. We can do the mm, second way to 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 calculate the, the median in this case, which is. Uh, median 2 and it's going to be to our image collection we are going to apply a reduce function and the reduce function require which type of reducer you want to use and in this case exists the reduce reducer median so there are different ways to apply reducers to uh, our uh, image collection. So when you're talking about reducer, is it called reducer because it is aggregating data? Yeah. It's computing yeah. The, yeah. the statistical measure through the time series you have. There. Yeah. We can, we can plot it. We can visualize our image. So I'm going to copy and paste uh, this line. It's going to be faster and I'm median. I'm going to put the names correct because if not, later is a problem. And we can run. Yo. Aha, and I got a problem. I use it median 2. Median 2 is telling me an error, which is you are using a visualization parameters with uh, SR BAM4 and you don't have that ban. But uh, consider one thing. If I use the first one, instead median 2, I use only median, and I run the function, I don't get that error. And I don't get that error because this is the different ways that you, uh, this is the things that you should consider when you are using different ways to reduce image collections. In the case of the median function, doesn't change the names. I can reduce the visualization parameters. In the case of uh, reduce ee dot reducer median, the name of the bands change, and I cannot reduce the visualization parameters. Okay. So in this case, uh, we have uh, here the uh, different information that we uh, plotted, and you can note it that we have three different layers. But which one is? Which one? We don't know. I mean, we start to print and visualize uh, images in our, in our map, and we don't have the information which one is which one. So let's add some names. Uh, you need to define in the point an uh, empty dictionary because we didn't use any visualization parameter, and we are going to tell this is the point. In the case of the uh, image collection, we can add a name, which is uh, image collection. And in the case of the uh, median, we can add the name uh, median image. And if you run now the script, you have the different names in the menu, and you can recognize which layer is uh, in, the, in, the, in the menu, okay? Um, 
more things that uh, we can do using uh, Google Earth Engine. We have an image collection, and uh, at some point, um, we have uh, different time acquisitions, and we don't know if the image collection is uh, sort by time or not. Or we would like to sort the image collection, consider one specific property of the image collection. For instance, in the case of Landsat, again, we can go back to the uh, information, and you can see here image properties. If you click there, you can see the different type of properties that each image in the image collection have. Okay? So we can filter, or we can sort, in this case, uh, the image collection considering one specific property. We can uh, order the image collection considering the uh, cloud cover that we have. We can uh, sort the image collection considering the time acquisition. We can uh, order the image collection considering uh, the, I don't know, the earth sun distance acquisition, I don't know. <laughs> The different type of uh, properties that we have in the images, we can use it to short the image collection uh, in that way. So let's uh, short our image collection. Just one comment is, yeah. uh, when the, the, this is Landsat data, these properties change depending on the products you are using. In the yeah. case of Landsat, when they produce this reflectance data, they use an algorithm which the name is LEDAPS, and in addition to have the correct data, they have like metadata, which is uh, information associated with the tile of the Lancer. So you can use filters to remove data or filter information in a way. But this, it's only one uh, field for each tile, and you can use that data. Yeah. To sort the image uh, in an image collection, you use the function sort, and you need to tell the property that you wanted to use. In this case, I use it the time acquisition. Okay. So if I live like that, uh, I think that uh, by default short, uh, shorter in uh, the standard mode, uh, ascendant mode, I'm going to check because sometimes I cannot remember everything, but uh, image collection short and uh, ascending. Uh, if you put it true, it's ascending. If you don't put anything, it's uh, ah, here. The fall is true, it's ascending, okay? If I wanted to take the most current image, I need to change uh, the order. And in order to change the order, I only need to put here uh, uh, false, okay? Now I have an image collection shorter in a descending mode by time acquisition. I can take the first image and then I take the most current image acquisition that I have in that image collection. In order to select a image, uh, the first image of the image collection, you need to use the function first. And in this case, we can print the information that we have here, and we can see the information in the console. That we have an image is really, it's already defined there. And uh, this image uh, was at quite, it's not the most current, I made a mistake, no? Ah, yes, it's the most current in, in this, it's, most, yeah, it's the last one, yeah, because we have until September, 13 September 2022. So this is the most current image in the time range that we selected previously, okay? And you can see also the properties that I commented you before. This image uh, has a cloud cover of uh, 4.21, so there are very uh, few images, uh, very few clouds in the image. We can also plot it, that image, as the same that we did it with the median, because this one is an image. And we can change the name, and this one is the uh, current image. And we can scroll a little bit out and it's loading things. I'm going to disconnect the image collection because already so, the median too, because already so. And this one is the tile that we get as the most current image. 
until uh, 13 of September 2022. Okay? Now we are going to do some. Is the most currently image because this image was acquired in uh, 7 of September 2022. The most recent. The most recent yeah. Yeah, even though it's the first one because she has sorted the collection in the reverse way. So the, so the first one is the latest one. False, yeah. So yeah, if you don't put false in the code, in the short image, here, if you don't put false, you are going to take the first one. If you put false, you are going to take the last one. Yeah, you reverse it. You cannot short the data. With the time going, well, the earliest one to the latest, or you put false, the latest to the, to the last one. So if you take the first, you take the, late, the last one. It's a bit <laughs> weird, but this is... Mm -hmm. so, so now you're saying that the erasers displayed is like the most recent image in like Until 13 of September, yes. Can you go to the properties Yeah. Can you go to the data acquiring? There? Date of acquisition. Date of acquisition. Uh, you can. Ah, in the top. Uh, date of uh, date, uh, data acquired. Okay, yeah, here. Everything clear? So all these are not the metadata. Yeah, this is the metadata. Yeah, these properties are metadata. That the, the creators of the... Stack. The what? It's all stack. Right? What do you mean you stack? This collection is like everything is stored in stack. Uh, ah, I, I think that Google Earth Engine doesn't store the data in stack. They use their own proprietary format yeah. to, ma to... So it's not all stack, but the terminology that you're using, collections and the data sets, Okay, ah, it could okay. look like that, but I think they are not using stack. They use a different thing, which is not open source or whatever they do. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, sorry. No, that's yeah. <laughs> so now that uh, we have, uh, we have started to play a little bit with the collections, uh, let's do uh, some operations with our image, because, I mean, uh, let's, let's start to do nice things with them. Uh, as uh, we are remote sensing people, uh, at least uh, most of us, I think, that are remote sensing people, uh, what is the typical thing that a remote sensing person is going to do with a reflectance uh, image? Uh, we are going to calculate and DVI. I think that all of you know that, no? <laughs> I think that uh, we don't need to remind that the NDVI is the near infrared minus red divine near infrared plus red, but just in case. And uh, in this case, there are also, as the same than the reducers, there are different ways to produce products uh, or calculations in Google Earth Engine. First of all, I'm going to show you the most simple one, because uh, in that case, I start also uh, putting the seat on your mind that we are working in a cloud. We are not working in our laptops, even if we can see our browser uh, on, on a screen. So, we cannot take uh, the band red and add the band one using a plus uh, mathematical operation. That We can do that in our laptops, in Python, in MATLAB, we can do that. We have one matrix, another matrix, and we zoom the elements, and that's all. But in this case, that doesn't, have, that doesn't work, because all the objects that we are, going, we are using nowadays in, in Google Earth Engine now are in the cloud. So they have predefined their specific functions to do that. So uh, in the case of uh, uh, NDVI, it's simple because uh, use a simple operations. Uh, add uh, images, uh, subtract images, and divide images. So first of all, we are going to define one variable for each band that we are going to use. Because uh, as you can see in the uh, image that uh, we have already here, we have different bands here. We need to select one specific band, which is going to be the red. In order to do that, we take the image and we use the function select and we tell that we want uh, the image uh, 
SRB4. Okay? So, once we have the red, we can define the near infrared. And I'm going to copy and paste because it's going to be faster. And the uh, band of the near infrared in Landsat 8 is the band number 5. Okay? So, as we have two variables, we can calculate the NDVI directly. We are going to take the red and we are going to add the near infrared, but we are going to use the function add because the objects are in the cloud. And we add the near infrared. Uh, sorry, it's not add, it's substrate because first of all we divide uh, substrate and later. Now we need to divide and inside of divide we are going to put red add near infrared. This is a simple way to define expressions in Google Earth Engine, okay? The problem is that uh, in NDVI is super simple. Ah, it's a couple of functions and uh, we don't have any problem. What happens if we have a complicated expression, long expression? We can, use, we can use the function expressions to define expressions. And it's going to be a little, a little more simple in that case. So another way to define the NDVI, and I'm going to use number two, is using my image, which I, ha which, which I have different type of bands there, I'm going to define an expression. And this expression is going to be the near infrared minus red divide near infrared plus uh, red. I'm going to put also parentheses here. So this is the expression of NDVI. Oh, sorry. It's because it's Spanish, and yeah, yeah, thank you. So we have expression there, but uh, we didn't tell which band is which variable that we have in the expression. We need to define that. And in order to define that, we use a dictionary. Oops, a dictionary. Okay? I, uh, I don't know if all of you know what is a dictionary. No, okay, no problem. A dictionary is a, well, maybe I'm the wrong, the, the worst person to define what is a dictionary here, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> a dictionary is a type of object that you use, uh, and you have two elements in the dictionary. One first part, which is the key of the dictionary. You can uh, put it strings there and, and uh, use it uh, different names for the keys. And the second part uh, of the dictionary is the values or, or information that you wanted to keep it in that key. So it's kind of a call elements with a specific name. The name is the key, and the elements that you wanted to call are the second part of the dictionary. I don't know if I did it. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> now I'm going to ask for the person that answered me no. If, did you understand me? <laughs> Yes? Okay. <laughs> so we need to define uh, the dictionary using the key as a near infrared uh, uh, um, string, the near string, which is going to be the band near infrared of Landsat. So in this case, the values that we are going to use for that near infrared is the image and I think that I have here, so I'm not going to copy and paste. This one is the red, so take care, because I copy the red, so I need to put five here, and I have two dots here. And we need to define which is our, I'm going to put some enters here, and then you can see the code well. The red uh, variable is going to be the image select uh, band 4, okay? You can use this one or you can use 
the names that already we defined before. So that is according you prefer, how you prefer to code. Okay? So in this case, uh, now we have the uh, near infrared. We can we can print because I didn't I didn't show you anything. Just start to type in uh, at <laughs> super fast and didn't print anything. So let's print what we have in NDVI and what we have in NDVI two. So if we run now this. I start to appear different uh, images and uh, now we know the order because we know that the order appears as we have in the code. We can also add names is if you consider. We are going to use expression here and then we know that it is the NDVI calculated using the expression and the previous one doesn't have name is the previous one. Okay, we have an image with only <coughs> one band. And this band contain the name of the first band. Yep. It's near infrared. No one tell me anything here, but it's near infrared minus red. <laughs> so <laughs> sooner or later I noted my, my typos. <laughs> so in this case, uh, we have the name of the band of the first image that we use it in the expression. And in the second case happen the same. We have the name of the first image. We can keep it like that and then when we work with uh, the near inf uh, NDVI we need to keep it in mind which is the name of the band that we have or we can change the name of the bands using the functions uh, rename and we can do that here. we can uh, to rename and we can use the name NDVI in capital letters if we want or in lower letters as you prefer. And in this case, now the first, the first NDVI is still keeping the, the name of the band, but in this case we rename the, the, the bands. Okay? Another way to calculate the NDVI is using a predefined function that uh, Google Earth Engine has, which is called normalized difference. So we can use our image and we can apply the function normalize difference. This function is a function predefined um, uh, in, in the application and if you go to the uh, documentation, uh, you can note it that you only need to put the name of the bands that you are going to use. The function calculate this expression, first minus second, divide first uh, plus uh, second, and the arguments in the band list, you need to put it the band list names as first and second, and then it's going to take the first here and the second here. Okay? So if we do that, we use a, a square brackets because it is a list, uh, the thing that uh, we need to define according to the documentation. And then we need to use the name of the uh, bands of our image. We know that uh, band 5 is the near infrared. I put the near infrared first because if not, I'm not calculating the NDVI. And then uh, the second one. And with that, I have an NDVI 3 <coughs> that if we run the, the code, we are going to see that the name of the image is not going to be the name of the band uh, that it is using as a first uh, case. It's going to have a band name D, uh, ND, normalized difference, come from there. We can also change the name if you want it, okay? Exactly the same than before. Rename and the name of the band that you wanted. And the last uh, way that you can define expressions, uh, and uh, the last thing, the last uh, uh, way that I'm going to show you how to calculate the NTVI is defining functions. We can define functions as whatever programming language, and then uh, we can apply the function to our image, okay? 
So first of all, we need to define functions. In order to define functions, we need to type in function. We need to uh, add a name before. Um, I don't want to use NDVI, uh, NDVI function, something like that, to not be very redundant with the names. And we need to add inputs in our function, as whatever function, and we are going to use an image in this case. So we are going to define an image as an input in the function, and we need to tell inside of the, this um, parenthesis, uh, uh, sorry? Curly brackets, thank you. <laughs> in that curly brackets, <laughs> uh, what we wanted to do in that function. So in this case, we are going to calculate uh, NDVI. We are going to, I'm going to put another name for not be redundant every time. And we can uh, calculate NDVI using the normalized difference, for instance, I'm going to use the input of the function, take care with that, because I copy and paste. And uh, we need to return something from the function, because if not, we don't have anything, so we need to return, in this case, NDVI uh, 6, and uh, that's all. If I return like that, I only, I'm going to get only one band, which is the NDVI. As is a function that I'm going to use a, a image, I can keep it also the reflectance values and all the bands that I have previously in my image, adding the results as a band into my image. And in order to do that, I can take my image dot advance and I can put it in the NDVI there. Then I, I'm not lose the information of the image, okay? So now we have the function defined, we need to apply the function, of course, because if not, we don't do anything. So in the case of NDVI4, we are going to calculate the NDVI using the function NDVI function, and we apply to a image. Image, our image. Image. Image, yeah. Okay? If we plot it, this information now, you are going to see that you don't have only one band. You have all the bands of the land, uh, all the uh, all the Landsat bands plus the NDVI. So here is the original Landsat, which uh, has 19 elements, 19 bands, and now we have the uh, original Landsat, which contains 20 bands, which are all the reflectance, quality flags, all the information, and the NDVI at the bottom. Okay. Any question until here? No questions? It's curious that no one asked me how I can visualize my NDVI. <laughs> <laughs> So, as the same that uh, futures, futures collections, image, image collections, where images are going to use the map dot at layer function. So I'm going to reduce a little bit of code, but take care with the visualization parameters, because well, in this case, if I print the NDVI four, I'm still having the reflectance values, but if I print the NDVI three, it's just one image with one band we have a visualization parameters that is taking, is looking for three bands, we are going to get an error. So I'm going to delete this one, and I'm going to print like that. Let's see what uh, we can visualize and uh, what we can see. I'm going to up this, and I'm going to leave you the code there, and we can run this. I'm going to scroll a little bit. I'm going to take out these ones, and yeah, let's see this one. Ah, current image? No, this is NDVI, of course, because... And uh, this is the NDVI 3. I took it the NDVI 3. Okay? This is the NDVI. As before, well, first of all, we see in a gray levels because we didn't add any color. So this is the uh, uh, first things that we need to consider. 
we can uh, again extract the parameters, uh, visualization parameters, the menu as the same done before. And we have the a spectral range between minus one and one. Probably minus one and one is too is too. too uh, yeah, probably minus uh, zero point five or something like that, and uh, zero point eight maybe. And zero polymer is pretty much flat, so. So it's lower. Zero to zero eight. Zero eight is okay for you. Zero the minimum. Yeah. Ah, zero directly. Ah, okay. Then zero and 0 0.8, okay? And we have here a palette. We can define a palette. I'm going to do it in a faster way because I don't want to spend too much time uh, with the colors. But if you click there, there is a plus color. So you can add different colors. Uh, we can add uh, three different colors, for instance, uh, green, red, and uh, white, okay? I think now is uh, tricky because I don't remember which one is the highest and which one is the lower. I think that with these positions, I'm going to get higher values with red and lower values with uh, green. But let's try it. We don't know it. So, yeah, but the yeah. white color is a bit misleading. Can you replace the white for any video? For what? Any color. Any color you wanted yellow? Whatever. Yeah. Okay, yellow. Yeah. So. We have uh, the, um, I can say that uh, higher colors are red uh, and lower colors are green. <laughs> you reverse the colors could be easier. Yeah, this is a <laughs> cropland area in Valencia, which yeah. is a rice, so that's why it's higher. And the other is pretty much shrubland, so it's very low vegetation. Yeah, that's so why. I change the color and then it's going to be better. Yeah, see? Yeah, perfect. So, and also, we don't have to higher values here, eh? but okay. Yeah, it's September. They have harvest. Right? Ah, yes, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> so, you can define the colors. You can import in the code exactly the same that we did it before, and then keep it the palette for the next runs that uh, you wanted. So, we can also, also do that. Uh, so, we can import here. Remember that the code appear. Here we have a visualis uh, uh, image visualization parameters too that we can use at the bottom. And then we have, we can run the code and we don't need to define the colors again. So this is the different ways to define the NDVI. Now um, we are going to move a, a one step more because uh, I, I calculate the NDVI of one image, but I have an image collection. Probably, if most of you are used to code in Python, MATLAB, or whatever programming language uh, uh, high level, uh, you are going to think in a for loops, I think. Oh, <laughs> in, the, in the first steps, yes. <laughs> you are going to think in the for loops. But you need to take care with that, and, uh, uh, because at the moment that you start to use the for loops, we lose the power of the parallelization on Google Earth Engine. They define, by default, a function which is called map. In order to do a for loops internally, probably are not for loops internally, but it's a way to try to explain you what the function map is doing. And then you have an image collection, you uh, write dot uh, map and the name of the function, and that function is applied to each image that you have in the image collection. So it's the way to proceed in Google Earth Engine. You should avoid totally to use for loops in Google Earth Engine because, yeah, you you broken the, the parallelization of the of the platform, and uh, probably you you are going to have a lot of. Uh, I mean, if is it if it is a simple example, it's not a problem. But if you work with a hard uh, uh, example, trying to predict or classify uh, each image in an image collection uh, in a in a global scale, you are going to have problems with that. So uh, let's calculate the uh, uh, um, image the uh, NDVI uh, in our image collection. So we are going to define a NDVI in our image collection is uh, I jump it a little bit no it's here yeah it's here okay 
And uh, in that case, uh, we are going to use uh, our image collection that we had defined before, and we are going to apply a function map, and the function map is going to call our function to define the NDVI, which is NDVI function. Okay? So, if we print this, uh, that we calculate now, NDVI I see. We can see that uh, I didn't print it before the image collection. We only printed one image, but uh, now we have an image collection with uh, 306 elements that we had before. But each image inside had a new one, has a new one, which is called ND, which is our NDVI. Okay. Uh, I don't want to uh, jump uh, things. No, so I'm, yeah, perfect. Now, um, we calculate the NDVI image in uh, uh, different ways. And we wanted to uh, keep it in our computers. Before, uh, there was uh, one person that asked uh, or commented if QGIS doesn't make sense nowadays, something like that, no? Uh, um, you can note it that uh, um, do fancy things in Google Earth Engine sometimes is a little bit uh, hard task, I can say. Or uh, add test in the maps are a hard uh, code uh, timing uh, at some point. It's not easy as can be in Quantum GIS or RGIS or another type of software that uh, you can use for visualizing your images. So uh, we can export our NDVI image and then in our computer, we can uh, create a fancy map, putting the coordinates, the north, the grid, whatever, okay? So let's export our uh, NDVI image. We are going to take the number three because it's only one band. And in order to do that, we need to use the function export dot image dot to drive. I put it to drive because there are different ways to export from Google Earth Engine, as we commented before. One of it is going to drive. In that case, it's going to use our uh, drive account, and from our drive account, we can download to our computer. There is no way directly to download an image from Google Earth Engine. You need to pass by Google Drive. Another way to export is export to the assessed. Okay, so we can keep it, the information here. We don't need to process every, uh, proce process every time that we wanted to see the image. Uh, uh, we can save the results and then we can load again that data in Google Earth Engine. Or we can use Google Cloud. There is the third way to uh, export. Uh, um, the three ways to export data in Google Earth Engine. You have to cloud storage. In that case, you move directly to Google Cloud. Take care because in that case you are going to pay. Okay? So... The second one was the asset. The first one, the drive. The second asset. In, and the third one, the uh, cloud storage. The last one is when you pay. Okay? So... I'm going to explain you the how to export to drive because you, you are not going to pay. And you will know because they will ask you for the credit card, so. Ah, <laughs> yes, of course, yes, you cannot do anything without. <laughs> so in order to export the uh, uh, image, uh, um, there is different ways to do it, but uh, I prefer typing the dictionary because I'm not going to uh, use all the inputs that the, image, the function requires, so I'm going to do it uh, faster. And in that case, uh, we need to tell which image we are going to export. Uh, which two dots? Yeah. Uh, the image that we are going to export is the NDVI 3. So we put it here, the image 3. We need to tell the description. The description is the name that is going to appear in our task. Okay? If I use PR, I'm going to get PR. If I use NDVI, is going to appear in DVI. I can tell also the name of the file that is going to be exported in Google Drive. 
if I don't use that name, it's going to use the description name. So I'm not going to use it because it's going to be an DBI and that's all. Okay, but you need to consider that sometimes maybe you use two different names. And I'm going to tell the folder in Google Earth Engine, uh, in, in my Google Drive, that I wanted to keep it. So in this case, I'm going to put it G, for instance. You can put the name that you want. You don't need to have the folder already created in Google Drive. So automatically it's creating in your account if you don't have that folder. And then if you run the script now, appears here the task. This is the NDVI task that I submitted. I didn't submit it yet because I didn't run the process. I can run the process and appears a menu also. In this case, you can change things also. You can change the coordinate system if you want. You can do it also using the function export. Uh, uh, you don't need to wait until this menu. You can change the scale if you consider. And also, if for whatever reason uh, you decide, I don't know, in Drive, no, I wanted to keep it in other format, you can change here in this menu. And uh, at the moment that you click Run, I'm going to do it. I don't know what, uh, how many times it's going to require this, but uh, yeah. It appears the task here. Every time that the task is in this gray color is that it is or sending or running or doing something in Google Earth Engine. You can see the status, open the menu. Then in this case, it's running on server, okay? At the moment that the task finishes, you have two different options. You can get the blue color, which is super okay. Or you can get the, uh, oh, I don't have the right color. Disappear the red color. So sorry, before I had a red color there. <laughs> And I got an error. When you get a red color, you can imagine. <laughs> uh, the error information in these cases, um, you need to read and you need to consider. And it's a little bit complicated sometimes debugging the, the uh, export errors. Okay, But uh, if you have problems, always you can uh, write a message in the forum. And the uh, uh, Googlers has access to your IDs because you can provide an ID of your task, and then they can check what is happening, OK? And um, you probably one last thing, maybe yeah. because we are ready. Yeah, we can are in time. Can no? reduce the mapped NDVI, calculate the mean of the NDVI over after mapping? Um, yes, of course. We can, or the maximum NDVI. Or whatever. Or, yeah? Yeah. yeah. As a last thing. Yeah, yeah because it's time. It's 3.30, right? Yeah. No problem. Perfect. So, uh, we have the image collection here. We saw that we had uh, 306 elements, and uh, we can calculate uh, a, 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 a statistic value of our image collection. And we did it before with the with the image collection. We can we can select the specific band that we wanted to reduce, and we can apply directly a reduce. Okay, so. Uh, it's going to be the uh, maximum, medium, minimum? Whatever operation you like. Maximum NDVI? Yeah, let's see how green it I mean, I'm improvised a lot today here. <laughs> of the image collection. So uh, in this case, we have the image collection with the NDVI. That image collection contains not only the NDVI, so we are going to select the uh, NDVI uh, band in all the image of the image collection. I think I didn't change the name, no, of the... ND, I think it is, yeah. ND, yeah. yeah. So, ND. And we can reduce... I'm going to type in uh, reducer. Reduce. EE dot reducer dot maximum, okay? Then you can see different type of reducers. We can uh, plot, uh, visualize. I'm going to copy and paste this one because it's going to be faster. And uh, we can visualize our maximum NDVI. So we run the... Yeah. We stuff. Sometimes <laughs> happen. You just try again and it works. <laughs> and I got an error. Uh, aha, 
see, because I reduce the uh, uh, parameters. So I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to copy and paste these visualization parameters and I'm going to uh, reduce at the bottom here. And I'm going to tell them I don't have ND band. I have ND max band because the reducer changed the name of the bands. And I'm going to run again. And when you run the reducer, it adds like an underscore and then the name of the reducer. So that's why. So I'm going to go out a little bit. When we're exporting the image, it's saving the gray image, not the colored image. No, it's saving the data. The data. Actually. As a TIFF, as a GeoTIFF. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's saving not like what you see, it's actually uh, exporting like the, 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 the data itself. Yeah. So is there a way of exporting the. Um, the I think I. I yeah, don't recall doing no. that. Yeah. It, you can capture, I guess, the screen. I don't yeah, know. I have never. This is a, it's a capture the screen. It's, it's, it's kind of a software, uh, well, in RGIS and Quantum GIS, you can save the, the palettes, but uh, not here. This is where NB, I think, is still alive. You can, you can do one thing. I mean, this is hexadecimal um, color palette. So probably you can use in Python, for instance, or in uh, uh, yeah, local programming yeah. language. Yeah, export as fast as you know, just for exporting data. Yeah, export yeah, well, yeah. the file of uh, the, the, the Not, not actually file. the representation thing. No. You have some options, maybe you have like a time series and you want to plot it, and you can do that. Yeah. But this is more for animations or something like that. I don't recall just exporting like what you see there, probably because whatever you can do here, it could be done better using Quantum GIS or RGIS, so you don't have put so much effort into it. So. Yeah, I, I told Emma to do this last step because um, at the end what she's showing is a mapping of NDVI over, over 306 scenes of Landsat. It's computing over this data, like the mean value. So there is a lot of data involved there, actually. And you can see like it in a, in a, min, no, in a minute, in seconds, it's right there, yes, produced. And even if Emma draws like a polygon covering the full Spain, you, you can do the same thing and it's going to be as fast as like that. And it's a 30 meter, well, it's not exactly 30 meter resolution because mm. when it's when showing, it's like it, again, it's a lazy operator. So here it's not actually 30 meter thing. It's just, I uh, use like a pyramid policy, depending on what you ask. Mm. But when you export and you say, I want this data th at 30 meters, then it's just doing the right thing, yeah. Mm. And you can note it, uh, the things that Alvaro said at the moment that you zoom in in the image, require more timing uh, than uh, when you are zoom out because yeah, it's, it's in another uh, uh, scale of spatial resolution. He's doing this dark thing I mentioned before, like, okay, I want to show this, I need to compute the filter data, ta -ta 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 -ta, and then it shows the data, yeah. Mm. yeah. So we can do a break if you consider. and. Uh, Continue later. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in this second part, um, I will probably need to speed up a little bit <laughs> because, it, um, but the idea is just to follow with Emma's presentation before, but going one step further in a way that now we are going to try to implement some. Um, oh, okay. Bye. Perfect. So, um, so the idea is just to implement. Um, some machine learning algorithms that are available in Google Earth Engine for to solve some very common uh, regression tasks. So um, that's the idea. I don't know if anyone I know one which is probably familiar with that <laughs> because you know about uh, relative transfer models, which is a very common kind of method that so basically allows to connect uh, reflectance data from satellites with some vegetation parameters that we want to estimate which are representing uh, the vegetation. Like, for example, the leaf array index is the number of layers that the vegetation has or the chlorophyll content or things like that. So the idea here is just to use um, a data set that is going to be used for training, and we are going to use that uh, to train a machine learning model to produce uh, 
maps of a given uh, biophysical parameter, which is the Leifert index at a global scale using MODIS data. And we are going to see like that's something pretty doable using Google Earth Engine. So the first thing that we need to add, I have already prepared. Um, I usually something I oops the screen thing is weird. Yeah, uh, it's. Oh, I can. Yeah, <laughs> well, I don't no, know. I need some glasses. But, but uh, it's it's only a second, Alvaro. It's okay, not a perfect. Problem. You wait a bit and appears again. Yeah. Okay, let's see if it works and I will not. Okay, let's go again. Well, we can go to Valencia. Let's try to use um, uh, something that I use pretty often. Is um, I use this uh, point geometry where I can just draw a point. You see that the location is here. I don't know if you can see it. So that's a way when every time you want to test or to plot some results, you just need to move this location a different location and you can run the code and you can chart things and see results. So, okay, we have the geometry. We are going to name it in a something uh, export area, for example. Okay. And as Emma said before, we want to um, oh, another magic trick <laughs> that Emma didn't display, <laughs> but it's very handy. Uh, when you know what you are looking for in Google Earth Engine, for example, I know that I want to write center object, right? But I know it starts with center. So I hit control and space, and it automatically completes the sentence for you. It's handy just to avoid some typos. Um, so, okay, so I want to center my view in that area. So it's export area and the sum, uh, zoom yeah. level. You miss it, yeah. And, okay, so in theory with that, just running here. Okay, we have the zoom level that we want. Okay, whoops, perfect. And, okay, and I have, a, as I said, I have already um, ingested the uh, data set, so I did that. I had a CSV with the um, X variables and the Y that I want to estimate. So I, you can import that with assets here, and you can, for example, add uh, new, you see, like you can import like an image here, like a GeoTIFF. You can import zip files, and you can import here CSV. So you have your lookup table that you have produced with, you know, even ground measurements that you go to the field and you can measure things. So you can import that here, and you can use this information like a table in Google Earth Engine to do whatever you want to do. In my case, so I have ingested already this table, uh, having this information. I'm going to import that. So training, oops. I'm going to keep the feature. Smaller, the smaller? Ah, you mean this part? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, probably we don't need that anymore, so <laughs> let's be focused more in this part. So it's a feature collection. Oops. So the name of the collection is users. In a string. A string, yeah. This almoma153 is my Gmail account. That's why it has this name. It's where I have information. So the name of the collection is FIPAR Lie. Subset 500. OK, in theory, that should be the collection. Let's see if we have something meaningful there. Every time I do anything, I just do, like to print because, as I said, this is a lazy guy. So if I don't ask for things, he doesn't do anything at all. So run. I You can see like these uh, yellow things blinking. Okay, I'm just plotting the first feature I have in my table. And as you can see in the properties, I have band 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and which is the X variable that I want to use to train my machine learning model, model and the Y that I want to predict. 
So this is uh, two biophysical parameters, the FA part, which is the amount of radiation that the plants can use for photosynthesis size, and the leaf area index, which is the number of le le uh, leaves of, of vegetation you have. So. Yeah. I am making, yeah. But I mean, you can't use it, right? The what? You can't use the CSP. Yeah, yeah. Is it 153 or L53? Sorry? Uh, AL. AL. Yeah, it looks like one, right? The second one before 53. One, 153. Ah, okay. Yeah. But we have access to your. Access In theory, yes, yeah. I guess so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you can complain about it. <laughs> we could try to change it, but yeah, it has to be accessible, yeah. This is not important. This is not like a science. Uh, this is a subset to train the thing. So don't try to publish a paper with this data set. <laughs> no, not because it's a problem. It's because it's uh, just a for you know for uh, you know to learn how to do stuff. So anything you upload as an asset, other people can access. No, no. no. you you you. Yeah, you, you can decide. You yeah. want to be open to everyone. It can be shared with a group of people that you have in a Google group with a use specific user, mm -hmm. or you can decide. It is pretty flexible about mm -hmm. doing that. Yeah. You you when you already upload the data, is the the moment that you decide with whom uh, you would like to share. Okay, so the next step, we need, as I said, we want to use and to produce, to train a machine learning model, and we want to use a MODIS data, which is a medium resolution, pretty much optical satellite. It has a very long term series. We want to use MODIS uh, data to produce these estimates. So let's to get first the image collection in the same way that they made it before for the Landsat. So we name it the collection a MODIS MCD43 A4. The reason why this name is because it's the name of the product, which is um, surface reflectance modis information uh, at M bar, which it means that it's basically being observed uh, nadir observation and uh, nadir illumination. Uh, okay, so e, e image collection. And the name of the collection is because you have to be cautious because there are so many versions of the of the same data. So here this one is Modis. Check. Six one. Uh, MCD. Forty three. A four. Comma. Okay. In theory, that should work, but I'm going to print it just in case because it's going to explode if I don't say something like first. Because for now I'm trying to first. Uh, to print the whole data set of modis, it's going to see that's too much. So I only want to see that I have access to. Uh, yeah, run again. Yeah, I this is know. kind of. A, mm, Okay, yeah. <laughs> in magic happens. You run the same thing three times, and at the and end, now it's and now the second one. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. well done. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of weird stuff that you never know. Uh, okay, so we have access. This is the first image I have for the full collection of Modis data. Yes, I wanted to check if I have access to the data, but as I explained before, we don't want to use uh, because this is a daily reflectance. So there is a lot of images here. So let's to constrain a little bit the calculation. So we are going to filter the date for a more reasonable period. So it's going to be, for example, I constrain that in my, for my example, 2016 or for zero one, just to the growing season, maybe 2016, 09. 30, let's see. Let's filter date. Filter date. No, but, yeah. Okay, so it should work now again. No problem. Perfect. Okay, we have our connection. And we need to do the next thing, which is we need to, something that Emma haven't explained before, but I'm going to explain now. It's these images, if for example I see. Uh, 
I try to show you what is going on here. You have this NADI reflectance band, which is the reflectance in the similar way that uh, we had before for Landsat. But we have this nice, or I don't know, this information here, which is the BRDF, albedo band, mandatory quality band. Um, again, if you want more information, the detailed information, as, as Emma said before, you can find it here, just adding the collection. But, um, oops, oh, this is too small. This one? Yes. I just took, you see that my pointer is here? Uh -huh. I just click here and I click in the in the in the uh, map screen. So I put this point here. So this is a trick just to every time I want to run a chart or something, I just need to move here and automatically it's going to change my chart in the console. Instead of like Emma has mm -hmm. done before, like putting by hand, you know, the coordinates, that's a way to more uh, dynam dynamically actually change the location. And he changed the name uh, geometry, oh. which is by default the name, by export area. Yeah. Okay, so I was going to, uh, yeah, this is the information as Emma uh, saw before. Um, the, in the bands, you have the reflectance, which is what we want to, to use to, for our predictions. But we have all these um, mandatory quality band. But basically it means that when they try to retrieve information, they give you a very simplistic but useful enough uh, information that means that if you have good quality data or you have not so good quality data or bad quality data, that basically means that they have problems retrieving the information or they have clouds or snow or stuff that you don't know. So we are going to use this uh, quality information to mask out information which is not useful or is just noise in terms of monitoring land surface or vegetation. So in order to do that, we need to create, uh, well, and as you saw, sorry, sorry, because, well, the value zero basically meant good quality and one was bad quality or whatever else. So we need to use this information to keep the good quality information. That's the idea. And in order to do that for the full collection, we need to create, as Emma said before, at the end, and we need to create a function, right? Sorry? The filter date, this one? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I can put it that yeah. in the next line, so <coughs> you can see it better. Can you see it now? Yes. Thank you. So let's create this function for masking. Right, so mask modis Q&A, it's the name of the function, is going to take... Mm, parenthesis, oh, okay. The what? It's uh, another way to create a function, because before we put it the name in between, but it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> the what? Sorry? Uh, yeah. Oh no, sorry. Uh -huh, just, yeah. <laughs> I I wanted to create a function and but this name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Image. So we open this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So what we need to do. We need to create the mask. Mask is equal to, I don't know what to, to check. There's so much information here. Okay. So we need first to select the band that has the information, right? And that's another trick. You see like we have a different quality information for each of the bands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which are the bands that we have for um, for the quality information of uh, the MODIS in, uh, reflectance data. So there is one trick that you can do, which is you can select put in the name, or you can use a, a regular expression in order to select all the, yeah, a subset of bands we have something in common. In our case, we want to take the name here, 
but we add this thing here. That basically means that we are going to take at the same time band 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's basically what it means. All the bands, yeah, all that, the bands that start with this name. Mm -hmm. Right? So we want to create the mask to select what we want. Right? Mm -hmm. So. That basically means this is the same thing that selecting, uh, you know, like it could be like, I mean, write it. Yeah, but it should it be band star or band dot star? I think it's dot star. Dot right? star. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly the same if I took a list, let me try, and I started doing this. Tag, one, comma, oh, sorry. Two, all of Not them sure. till seven. That's kind of the idea. But in order mm -hmm. to write them, that's, you can use that to fast faster, the, to make the process faster, sorry. So, Maybe like the image. It's yeah, it's, it's going to explode. <laughs> you can do that too. Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah, did you say the one? Okay, but now we, we want to take the high quality information. We want to have creator mass taking the zeros of all the bands, right? We want to take only to create a mask that removes all the data, which is no high quality stuff. It means that we want to take data when all the quality bands are zero. So we need to reduce, this is the trick. The what? We use the dimension. The dimension. Yeah, we are going to reduce the, all the bands yeah. in order to consider that, the, well, you will see that, let me write it down, and you will see it very, reducer, right, mean. And, okay, let me put that in a different line because yeah, it's not, it's not going to be the challenging. Mm -hmm. So, what we are doing here is, okay, we are going to take the image that we have at the moment and we are going to take a subset of all the bands, which are the quality bands. Quality one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we say, okay, with all these bands, I'm going to compute, to compute the mean. So you're going to take, and sometimes it's going to be zero, zero, something. But what we know for sure is that if the mean is zero, it means that all the bands have been high quality. Does it make sense, everybody? I have a question. So if in case you go to BRDF albedo band and you open it, in, in that case there is a parameter called dimension which clearly tells for how many it is zero and for how many it is one. Can't we just select where it is zero? No, no, no. The dimensions are the dimensions of the image. The number of rows and columns. So, what does zero and one mean here? Is the value of the matrix, uh, the element in the matrix. Oh. The value of the image is mm -hmm. different. The yeah. dimensions are the dimensions, the rows and columns that we have in a local. Uh, okay, so with doing that, this uh, oper logical operation here is as you, we are going to have a one or a zero, depending on if we have everything is zero, which is what we want, and if it is not. So, but we have only compute the mask. So we need to apply the mask to the data, to remove the data that we don't want. And in order to do that, we return, which is what we want, the image that we had, but with a trick here, we say, okay, we are going to mask the data using the information. Well, I don't like this name because it's mask mask. So I'm going to name it like mask one, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more clear now. Perfect. And another thing, just in case, because sometimes. Um, Properties with computer. Yeah. Uh, it's not clear, but at some point, uh, Google Earth Engine. Uh, loses track of what are the properties of the images. So you can, you can, you know, some of the metadata available in the images, I don't know, it disappears. So if that happens to you, just basically use this. Copy properties. And you take copy the properties of the image. That's a way to guarantee that you're not going to miss because you're taking whatever is in the original image and put it, put it there. So, okay. According to this, yeah, I don't know if it's clear what this function is going to do, but it's going to take every image, compute a mask, and mask out wherever the quality is not good quality. But we haven't done anything at all yet. We are going to actually, well, to apply the, the, uh, the thing when we uh, map it over the image collection, which is, um, 
one been filtered. All this filter dot map and we are going to map that function which the only thing is going to do is to go through this collection and start masking out information which is not high quality okay any questions so far nope okay so but again because I'm not so confident about my Google Earth Engine <laughs> skills I'm going to check if this is functioning we have something here we don't have any error mm. yep. but um, I'm going to I, because again I'm not super confident I want to check if I have masked out anything at all right so more this first and I'm going to select just the first band I don't know if Emma explained that, mm. but um, yeah, that's another way to select bands. You can put the name or you can just use an index. So zero is the first band, one, two, three, four, five. So that's another way. But I'm not really interested though. Just I want to, to check if I'm really masking out things. So let's try to check. Okay, it seems that something wants to be produced here. Needs time. No, I don't know. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> no, but kind of the yeah, browser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, wait, oh. wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eh, esperar, esperar. <laughs> yeah. No, with with. Uh, with Modis, you don't need it. Uh, in the way that Modis uh, doesn't provide the information by tiles, uh, it's only one image. It's a global, uh, es yeah. a global image. Yeah, with. Yeah, if you filter you in whatever part, uh, you are going to get one uh, the, the full image. Oh, wow. I don't know what's going on with the browser here. Mm. And I don't like this. You, you ask too much, I think. <laughs> no, in theory not. But I'm more, esperar, esperar. more concerned. What's going on here? Ooh. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I don't know what's going on. Wow, 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 wow. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not going to start again. So let me check. Go here. Uh, up, 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 up. Yeah, there. Okay. Let's go, we were... Yeah, you were there, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's... Uh, uh, a new one. Yeah. Um, what is the new one? That's a yeah, clear, clear. Clear. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. It should work now again. Okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, credentials? No. No, right. it's because... <gasps> what is happening? What's going on here? Uh, no, no, it's better. Let's get the first card in. Yeah, navegador. Sí, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Reset? No, refresca el navegador. Mm. Let's see if it wants to work now. Mm. Ah. Yeah. Okay, now it seems that it wants to work. Yeah, but uh, you didn't plot it. You didn't visualize. Yeah, I know. Mm. Let me put again the point. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> map. Add layer. Oops. Are you going to try again? <laughs> it has to work. I have done that, and it has worked. So it has to work now. First. First. Ah, yeah, the, w the function, and they cannot see the function. The line, yeah, I'm yeah, going yeah. to do it. Yeah. Okay, now you can see it? Perfect. Yes. I'm going to copy-paste it. Just in case. 
see the video uh, going forward okay. No. And uh, you can note it that sometimes uh, happen that type of things because Alvaro could uh, get the image <laughs> quite now fast it now. Now perfectly. <laughs> I don't know why it was yeah. not working. So anyway, mm -hmm. but we wanted to see is actually uh, just the first band. You see how there are holes so much data has been masked because it's uh, probably cloudy or the quality of the tree was were not good. So anyway, so this is what we wanted to mask out. Uh, information which is not reliable at that date and it works now and it was not working before I don't know why so okay we have the data ready we have ingested the um, uh, the uh, data that we want to use for training and now is the moment when we are going to train our machine learning model and we are going to use a very well-known and scalable approach with probably all you know, ra random forests, right? Everybody knows about them. They are hated, they are loved <laughs> at the same time, but they are easy to train and they, they scale pretty well. So anyway, so the, f the way to do it, we are going to, the information about how to do that, you can see that there is a, um, it's kind of weird because we are going to use a random forest for regression and you are not going to find any uh, regression thing when you try to use Google Earth Engine. You will see that all of them are classifiers, but some of them can be used for regression, like for example, decision trees, uh, SBNs, which is our super vector machines, can be used for regression of classification. You have also a gradient tree boost, which you can use for regression and classification, and a random forest, which is an implementation, is my random forest, which is, I think, a very general implementation. So we are going to do the example with random forest in this case. So we are going to name that RF, RF trained. And the way how we do that, we use a dot classifier, well, oh, a lot of them. This is the magic of the uh, da, 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 smart random forest. Okay. And we need to add information to the dictionary in order to, there are lots of parameters that you can put there, as you can see here. Let me check. Oh, the resolution is very low. But number of trees, number of per split, typical parameters that you're going to find in the implementation of random forest in Python, MATLAB, R, or whatever. I'm not going to go too much into the details. So, first thing that we are going to put, just to have a not super heavy uh, random forest, number of, you have to be very cautious about the upper and lowercase thing, number of trees, okay, for example, something not very big, like 40, for example. Another thing we need to mean leaf population. This is something that I found out what is typical, well known, is that just having a number higher than one uh, mean leaf population helps the model not to overfit so much. And this seed, it's just because random forest has some random uh, nature, it's a way just to f uh, fix the seed so you have reproducible results again and again. So, okay, in theory, this is the classifier. And you can define, well, let me check first if that works, right? Oops, okay, token, missing something? You missing something? Okay, here? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Number of trees. It's what? Ah, you, you need to oh. put two dots, not oh, yeah. equal. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. 
this is another thing when you work with JavaScript and Python at the same time, you mix the two dots with the equals. <laughs> Okay, this uh, is another run weird... Again. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. That's not usually no. common. I wonder why. Maybe okay. they are doing something. <laughs> so we have kind of the parameters initialized here. Okay, so let's continue with adding information. So as I said, this uh, random forest can be used as a classification or a regression. And we want to use it for uh, regression tasks. In capital, no? Everything? Yeah. I think. No. Okay, perfect. And now we need to set, to tell to the random forest, which is our training data, our features, and everything. So, uh, da, 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 train. Okay, features. Oh, that's a pain also because training features are going to be a list because we have to say to tell him which is the x and which are the y's. Mm -hmm. So, according to this, features are. I oh know this is the training collection. Sorry, mm -hmm. which is the, the, the training features. Okay, this is our training collection, comma, features input properties. Yeah, because remember that in the future collection you have both. You have the reflectance values and you have the biophysical parameter that you wanted to predict. So uh, you need to tell which one are the inputs, which one are the reflectance values, and which ones are the uh, is the output in, in this case, which are the biophysical parameters. Three, four... Five, I think there are seven of them, if I remember well. Check. Everything is going. It has to be. Oops. Here. Okay, perfect. And we need to tell the random force, which is the variable we want to predict, which is the class property. Again, it's regression, but this is how it works. For example, the leaf array index, and I think it should work now. If I didn't make it, seems that you have a typo. Right? Yeah, maybe. Okay, a comma missing mm -hmm. here. Okay, it should work now. Okay, so again, let's try to check if everything is set up. Okay, so these are the parameters. It's not complaining. Input properties, classifier, mold, regression, class property lie, okay, perfect. In theory, according to that, we are ready, right? So we... we you can apply. You, yeah. <laughs> but we can, another thing that we can do, right, is we can talk about that or maybe... It's I still... I don't know, maybe it's too much. Was kind of running out and of. Then apply. Okay. Apply the classifier. The so this model. is already the the model have been trained because um, so and now we are going to do is just to take every image every image of the image collection that we have masked already and we're going to map this classifier over every image to produce produce basically the prediction of leaf area, leaf area index using the the um, modis reflectance. So okay. In order to do that, we need to create a function. Which is uh, we need to we are going to name the result like line maps, for example. Okay, yeah. So our image collection we are going to map. Map. And we to, that's another way to do the thing, which is implementing the function in place. Instead of creating the function and afterwards calling you, we can you can put the function directly in the mapping. You miss it at t. The what? At t. Function. Okay. So.
So, let's see. Another thing, minor detail here, right, is that the scaling of the uh, reference data, that's something that Emma mentioned before, it's written in the help. So we are using real, the training data set, the, uh, you can see here in the uh, feature collection. You see the properties, sorry, the features. You see that the uh, reflectance is varying between zero and one, it's a, a physical magnitude, so reflectance by definition uh, ranges between zero and one, so we need to scale the data from MODIS accordingly, and that information can be found in the documentation of the data. And the scaling factor is something like 0 0.0001, something like that. Let me check it out. You see the bands, min, max, I can mm. see it. Yep. You see the scaling factor here? 0 0.001. I don't know if they can see one. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> it's too small, but I can put it. Trust on Alvaro in that case. <laughs> it says 0 0.001. I have just copy pasted. So, mm, So it's here, the scaling factor, right? Mm -hmm. So, and another important thing here is that the names of the bands doesn't correspond with the names of the features that we have here, so we need to re rename them all to match. Mm -hmm. And because the random forest doesn't know, I need to know that the name of the bands are, cor are matching with the training data set. So, it's the image. We are going to select, and that's one trick, which is the why we one, we are going to rename and select at the same time, which is uh, seven. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. and the names that we want to put on it, which yeah, you are, have on the top. Yeah, mm -hmm. going to, I'm not going to break them again, so I'm going to put them here. Mm -hmm. So as you know, when you start working with Word and you start to kind of do, probably it's more confusing, but you try to do things more at the same time, not to have just so many long uh, source codes. But at the end, this is taking the function, the image, selecting the bands we want, which are the reflectance band, and name them with the names that we have in the random forest. But we need to do something else, which is uh, because they are integers, just in case we come, we, convert them to floats to have no uh, issue, and we need to also scale to match uh, the units of the um, data that we have used with the random forest, right? And the scale factor, we're going to factor. Is this one? So I use that here. Okay. So in that way, we have to scale the data properly, and the only thing that we have to do at the end is um, to compute the estimation, right? And the estimation is going to be the uh, um, data that we have here, we're going to use, scaled, and we use the command classify, which is basically uh, the command to run the random forest of our image collection. And what, which is your model that we have trained is this RF trained. You need to consider that, uh, I don't know if Alvaro tell you, but uh, the functions of uh, machine learning are focused on classification. So uh, every time you are going to find EE dot classify or uh, classifier or uh, something like that is because uh, at the beginning was uh, focus on classification. After that, they move the functions to model regressions. So in that case, they keep it the names of classification, and sometimes it's a little weird to think on that way. But uh, you only need to know that I would like to apply a random forest, so you need to look for the random forest in ee.classifier. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I tried to say that at the beginning, but yeah, it's it's important because mm. everything is inside the classifier, and you have to change mm. the output mode. Um, that is something that you can control here. If you use instead of by default this classification, mm. so but uh, if you need to specify regression in order to use random first for regression. So the last line that they have, well, a couple of lines is, okay, using this, the scale data, so we classify, which basically means we apply the random first we have trained, and then we return the estimates, and we again copy the properties, but we are mostly interested in not losing the information about the timing, because we want to have a time series of, la of LIFAR index. Um, okay, so in theory, all of these have to take the collection and map the classifier and produce the LIFAR index estimates, estimates that we want. So let's see if it's really working or not. First, okay. Okay, no error. No. I know, just to avoid typing, I'm, talking, <laughs> I'm, very, I'm lazy like Google Earth Engine, so. <laughs> I want to plot just the line maps. There is some because we are not adding anything, we are just replacing the collection and we are only providing the line map that we're estimating. So there is not anything to select. So let's try to see if we are obtaining something meaningful or not. Seems that yes, we have a map here. So the LIFAR index by definition ranges between zero and five, six, depending on, which is the number of layers of leaf you have in a canopy. So let's try it because Valencia is not very, has very lot of green vegetation, but okay. We have some estimates here of LIFAR index. Okay, this is the first image where I'm going to try to beautify this a little bit. Um, hmm. No, yeah, class. Whoops. Class. Yeah, but it doesn't. Oh? I don't know what's going on today. <laughs> it's, <laughs> not, it's not working well. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It doesn't work. Yeah, but uh, why you don't open the? No, it, no, I don't know. It doesn't work now. Let me try to. No open problem. Again. No colors. <laughs> no. Yeah, but click in the square. Yeah, but usually it opens no? automatically. Yeah. No. No. For whatever reason, it's not working now. This morning was working. <laughs> you have seen already. I wonder if they have done something <laughs> in the background or whatever. Don't know. Anyway, it has to be gray <laughs> for now. <laughs> um, okay, this is the first image that you have there. As you can see, we are just retrieving a LIFAR index on a global scale, running, uh, running a random forest, which is something, I would say. Uh, again, uh, with this time series, we can also reduce if we want. That's going to be more challenging, definitely. Let's see how much time it takes. But mm. but still working. Oh, yeah, is that? So this is considering how many, like 200 uh, Im MODIS images at the global scale? Let me check if now it wants to work. Oh, oh. look at this. <laughs> now it wants to work. Okay. It's, it's very slow. Yeah, I don't know what's going mm -hmm. on. It goes very slow now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it works. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm. Getting lazy. Will appear at some point. Yeah, every time it moves. Yeah, okay, there. Now See, it's yeah. <laughs> So this is again, um, has taken the random forest, has been trained, uh, and it's uh, being mapped over hundreds of days. And this is the mean value of the LIFAR index for a very large area. Well, I guess that we can go. Hmm. 
need some mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So I'm getting the same error from Okay, this is, it looks kind of slow, but we are processing like lots of pixels right here. So it's an example of how you can run a machine learning method. Um, yeah, I, I try like support vector machines, uh, regression trees, and yeah, it pretty much works in the same way, depending on your uh, preference about this. But this is working. Probably something else we are kind of running out of time that could be useful and think that Emma haven't showed that. We can chart the results so you want to see the time series of the Lifan index. So let me do that. To finalize, so in that way you can plot your results. You put it in internal on there. Door? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm, series. Mm -hmm. Image collection. So my image collection is going to be my live Leafar index maps. I hope I didn't make any mistake. The region where I want to compute this chart, because it could be like a point, or you can use a reducer over an area, you can compute the mean value, whatever you want. It's going to be my point sample, if I remember well the name. So you are going to plot it the leaf area in this predicted in yeah, the in point this, that this you have there. Location, oh, okay. yes. mm -hmm. Um, and you have to say, because now it's a point, but imagine that uh, you want to compute the mean value or the maximum over that area, right? So you can define a reducer. Something uh, specifically when, when you, or especially if you want to do something really fast because you want to plot things, instead of using a very complex uh, reducer, I usually use this trick. It's like for as a reducer, first. It's, okay, whatever is close, if you have an area, take one pixel. Yes, because you want to check uh, to show the, if the results make sense or not. And also you can uh, select the um, resolution of the reducer. You want to apply the operation. In that sense, I'm uh, using 500 meters, which is close to the modis pixel size. But you can do that, for example, if you're using um, uh, Landsat data, you can degrade the, the aggregated data using this scale information. So anyway, so this is the what we want to do. Let's see if, in order to, let's see if I have any mistakes here. Okay, it seems that's working. So I have the chart here, but it's doing nothing, Alain. Again, it's the lazy philosophy of uh, Google Earth Engine. So if you want to show the chart, you need to print it. So you see, print chart. And you can see now it says generating chart. Okay, so this is the variability of the Lifara index between the yeah early April till late November. This is the variability in this area. You can maybe here, no? The what? You can make oh, yeah. in one. Yeah, it's possible to see better. So this is basically the estimation of a machine learning model mapped over the feature collection of Modis. Uh, using a lookup table and everything is kind of well, kind of no running on the fly. You can note it also in this case that uh, once you plot it a chart, you can download the oh, data yeah. of the points, clicking in download CSV, and uh, it's a CSV file. You can also download the figure already prepared uh, as a. PNG, I think, uh, mm -hmm. because Alvaro mm -hmm. moved a lot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, and uh, I don't remember the third option, but you have another option. <laughs> yeah, as, as, yeah, like um, a vector, vector image, PNG, and CSV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just trying to find a spot with a very large uh, a rice crop. So in that way, you can see like really uh, the model is capturing the phenology of the rice crops. During winter, there is no vegetation. It rises, it, it grows very fast, it gets steady, and afterwards it goes down. 
So, yeah. Hmm. I don't know if there are any questions or. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> the what? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because every time it creates a new folder and it exports in that folder, right? In Google Drive. No, actually, in Emma's example that he, she saw before, you, if you say you create a folder in Google Drive like GE, I think it was your example. Yep. You say, I want to export my image or my CSV or whatever in GE folder. You do that and everything goes there. Yeah. But if I do the same thing again, and then if we replace the previously created folder with all the files inside, anything? No, no, no. It only adds, I think probably it, uh, I don't know if overwrites the file if it's the same name yeah if it is the same name you, you and if not write. it just add files mm. continuously mm. till they uh, so they could yeah you can do that too yeah. if you like yeah okay. yeah whatever the structure you put like G, whatever. Um, to create a new folder inside of a folder i don't see clear oh. that one oh. because you put it uh, uh, at least I try it uh, once or a couple of times and I put a slash between the name of the two folders and that recognizes as a folder because oh, it's yeah, one yeah. string. Yes, it does not. It does not create a subfolder. No. No. Oh, no, but uh, at the moment that you uh, write the name of one folder, if you don't have it, it's creating by itself. At the moment that you have it in your Google Drive, it's not creating a new one with the same name. It's, uh, everything is going to the same folder. Yeah. I think there was another question in the background. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I cannot hear you. No, you mean that if there is like a training and test? Yeah, this is that yeah, the way to do it. But we didn't go through that, yeah. Is there, is there like a function in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, can, you can actually add um, a property to your features, which is a random number. So, for example, it, yeah, and you say, okay, I want to take 70% uh, of the data. So you take values between 0 and 0 0.7, and the rest are... Leave one out, or leave one out, like cross valley. Uh, cave, well, less like uh, what's the name of this? Uh, you, you keep it for a out test. Out of, uh, uh, well, you know, like a testing, right? Or they just I don't remember the name in English. Leave out. Uh, no, leave one out is only one sample. I don't remember the name of the other, which is actually like thirty or twenty percent of data. Uh, for validation, you mean? Hmm. It has a name, but I don't remember now. A fall. <laughs> Yeah, fold, yeah. Um, K fold cross validation, okay. you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, whatever. Yeah, so you take 70% that you use a random number just to split your data set. Yeah, and that's usually how you work. And you say, okay, uh, filter, you know, in the same way that we have, we're using for uh, time or for the clouds or whatever, you filter everything between 0 and 0 0.7. That's training. And uh, after uh, bigger than 0 0.7 is going to be for uh, testing. And you can compute there. Yeah. And actually, there is something I haven't shown here, but you can also, uh, you have some um, explainability features. You can see yeah, the, the feature, feature importance of random mm. forest. You can show it here uh, in, in Google Earth Engine. You can also compute conf uh, confusion matrices if you are working mm -hmm. on classification. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, one point, one puntualization about the things of Alvaro. Uh, if, uh, if you wanted to, I mean, if you are in classification again, everything was focused to classification and uh, you can calculate the, cross, uh, the confusion matrix and, and you can calculate the accuracy and, and the kappa index, but take care because the, the, the confusion, confusion matrix of uh, Google Earth Engine is focused in training set. You need to, to use another function which is called errors, error matrix to calculate the values in test. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is uh, when you wanted to evaluate a regression model, you need to type uh, the error by yourself. There is not a room mean square error function or there is not a, a mean average function or whatever, or absolute function. Uh, everything uh, must be done by yourself. Yeah, you have to compute that by hand. I mean, it's not like the functions are very complex, but you have to do that by hand, yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I mean, actually, that this this subset of data is, has been is from a paper, 
and the way how we proceed to that for the inference we um, do all the fine tuning of the parameters, the training, and da 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 offline in your preferred Python MATLAB language, and afterwards you uh, obtain the optimal parameters for your regression, like the number of trees, you know, the random split or whatever, and then you can do the inference here. So you kind of put the heavy lifting or all the hard work to Google Earth Engine, and you don't need to, and you can drastically export, uh, you know, with the data for training or whatever for the location that you have. Well, that's not the case because we are using synthetic data from a radio transfer model, but you can do the other way around. Mm -hmm. Yes, use the try to speed up your your, your process doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I think people is tired. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> well, something that maybe we can mention, we can mention about the Google Apps, which is not th something to. No, we didn't mention about that. But you have an example if you wanted to show them. Yeah, and you have here. Once you yes, uh, once you create your own products, uh, there is an option that uh, you can develop uh, with the code uh, typing by yourself that load the data and that type of things. Uh, uh, um, application that uh, you can share the visualization of the data because in this case it's only visualization uh, using the applications of uh, uh, Google Earth Engine and in order to create that we don't have time to show you how to do that but uh, at least we can give you some tips that it is clicking in the APP button that you have at the top right and uh, you can use the, the code uh, that uh, you can create. Imagine that you have a classification, temporal series classification, for instance, land cover, and then you create a code that you load the temporal series uh, that you created, and then uh, using that code, you can transform in kind of a fancy way uh, or fancy visualization uh, tool for, for uh, disseminate your, your own results. Yeah, it's nice because you can, I mean, in the background, you can do whatever, whatever algorithm you want to do and you can access the data, but even you don't need, you can share the link and the people don't need to have even like a Gmail mm. account. So it's nice just to visualization and to give the people access to to uh, your, your results, right? Mm -hmm. And you can see like there is like a lot of things that you can do here, divide the screen in one part using one sensor or the other different times. I mean, it's a little bit complicated because it's very mm -hmm. tricky. But yeah, the good part is that you have a very nice front end if you get used to, to work with that to share your results with the scientific community or with whoever you want. Mm. And again, there is a lot of, uh, all of, the th of these things, you have access to the source code. This is actually how we have developed most of our apps. Just, okay, I don't know how to start, just check all the people's uh, code, you know, mm -hmm. how usually all these kinds are done because it's very specific and you try you just to do, adapt to your needs, so to say. Yeah.